Do you remember what the last thing was that gave you chills? <laughs> Maybe it was a, a song or a piece of art or something else entirely. That's an interesting question because I think I guess um, it would seem less self-centered for me to suggest it was some someone's art that I came across, but it would probably uh, you know if I'm honest it was an idea that I had, <laughs> and uh, I guess because those are surprising to me you know somehow if I'm coming ac across a piece of let's say public art or someone's uh, article I have this sense that it exists out in the world already, and that it doesn't necessarily strike me as um, as foreign, mm -hmm. but there's something about the strangeness, the foreignness of an idea that is what gives me chills or what's, what surprises me. And, and it's really about surprise, at least uh, from how I interpret that question. Um, the, the idea was, and uh, you let me know I'm going on too long about this, but <laughs> the idea is um, kind of a crazy one having to do with a notion I had when I was a sophomore in college. And it's a technical idea. Uh, at the time, I didn't have the skills, nor did I think, do I think there existed the computational capabilities to actually model this the right way. But the idea was, let's say you have a very long, large object in Earth orbit. Parts of that object, let's say the extreme ends of it, uh, are subject to a little bit different gravity, because after all, gravity goes with the inverse square of distance. And so uh, that leads to a thing we call the gravity gradient torque, which everyone knows about, and it's not interesting or surprising. But it occurred to me way back that maybe you could produce a force out of this as well, the so-called gravity gradient force. This, so this force on the center of mass is the result of the forces acting all over this thing. And because there's force acting at different places with different sizes, the force on the center of mass is actually a force that differs from the typical force on an object in orbit. So I, didn't, I don't think I could have articulated it that well when I was a sophomore in college. But now that I think I understand it, uh, that's true. The The chills moment came when I was, I don't know why I thought of this problem again, but I finally figured out a way to make that work. And it only took 30 years. You know, it's like Doc Brown, right, uh, inventing the time machine. You know, I finally figured out the flux capacitor for that thing. So we'll see if it works. It probably won't. But the <laughs> reason it gave me chills is like, oh, I see how that could work. And that was completely new. So in the world of science fiction, they call that the the novum, right? The sort of weird little new element that surprises people. Um, and to me, that's that's one that kind of gave me chills. And it's not, not the sense that, you know, I came up with something so good for me. It was really yeah. more like, here's a completely surprising thing I've never encountered before. A moment of clarity? Would you say that that's sort of? Well, uh, as I get older, those moments are fewer and yeah, farther between. Sure. But I guess I, I, it wasn't so much clarity. It was more, more like recognizing something that maybe I could have recognized before. And maybe it was there, but having seen it, uh, I think for the first time, it just gave me a sense of, you know, astonishment and kind of witnessing something in its complete form. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, it's a remarkable feeling to kind of get something um, and that maybe you didn't get before. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with that feeling of um, encountering an idea where it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily feel like it's coming from inside in mm. some sense. Mm. D is that a, f a feeling that you're familiar with? Yeah, that's a, that's a weird idea. That it, it gets to this question of where does creativity or invention yeah. even come from? You know, can you force yourself to come up with something that you've never come up with before? Or do you sort of sit back and let inspiration strike you, the muse, you know, from some great just, mythologies yeah. and somehow the, one of the muses just inserts something into your brain? I certainly don't know the answer to that. But, yeah, I know the feeling of... Uh, uh, yeah, inspiration. It's, and it's certainly a chill-inducing one. The Muse, I was, I was recently listening to Stephen Pressfield, and he his philosophy and his approach to creativity, as far as I understand it, is that he treats the Muse as if it is actually real. Mm -hmm. And so in order to generate creativity, you respect the Muse, which means you show up and you make yourself available for creativity to arrive. And then when it arrives, the sensation is as if it has come from elsewhere. And he he behaves as if that is literally true. And for him, he finds it to be very productive. So it's something I've, I've been experimenting with is mm. let's, let's pretend that creativity is out there and we're sort of antennas for it and we can make ourselves more receptive to these things or less receptive to these things in the way that we behave. Um, I, I don't have any conclusions about, <laughs> about that just yet, but it's, I, I like 
I like the notion of it, so I've been sort of experimenting with it. Yeah, sort of training yourself to to undertake uh, a set of activities or a process that you wouldn't normally undertake, sort of forcing yourself to believe this fiction that there's uh, some person out there who's ready to uh, yeah. dribble bits of ideas into your, your into your ear or something. I, I guess um, I have a little bit different recipe, maybe, for for finding these sorts of things out. I, I assume that it's possible, this impossible thing that I'm trying to do. And I just keep working it <laughs> till, okay. till it, you know, may, maybe eventually I have to give up, right? But I posit that it's possible. So in this, this example I was giving you of uh, this orbit mechanics trick where just due to the attitude of the orientation or the orientation of a body, it could actually propel itself forward. Um, that seems like it violates certain physics principles. It, it doesn't, by the way, but um, in that case, I just kind of kept trying to say it's possible, mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore, what am I missing? Like, well, what's what's the thing that I haven't thought of yet? Yeah, um, that's that's not different, I think, from this notion that there is inspiration that lives out there in a way that you're never going to track down, uh, right? Yeah, I guess it's those are sort of maybe a different kind of idea where it it sounds to me like this is an idea that's been sort of percolating for a while. Whereas there's those other ones that just sort of show up unannounced and you haven't really been contemplating stuff related to that. And then all of a sudden yeah. it, you wake up in the morning and there's a new thought there. And those feel particularly weird to me, I would say. Those feel a little bit more muse-infused or something. Um, the things ever come to you in dreams? Is that a thing that happens to you? I don't know if things come to I have had the I've had the experience on multiple occasions of... of Usually it's debugging some program, and I cannot uh – -huh. one of two things will happen. I'll work on it all day, and on the walk to the car, I go, oh, okay, I know what the problem is. Or I go to sleep and wake up and know what the answer is. Mm. And I don't – that's deeply weird to me because it suggests that some sort of gears are turning in the meantime or something. Mm. I, I don't know mm. exactly what to make of that. Um, so do you dream in C++? Is <laughs> no. No? Okay. <laughs> oh, good. No. Um, no, but it is a strange thing how it appears that that it seems like subconsciously we have the ability to keep working on problems. Yeah. Um, if you sort of make yourself, you put the information into your brain to allow for it to do that, it seems to seems to work occasionally. Yeah, sometimes when you doggedly force it, like I was suggesting, yeah. it, it works against that process. It's interesting. I I've I've been thinking about it too recently as um, like I've heard people describe luck as the situation where, what is it, uh, preparation meets opportunity? I, f I don't know. That's a cliche I've heard. But in any case, I've been, th I've been trying to think about, well, maybe creativity is the situation where preparation meets inspiration. And so maybe one way to respect the muse and to generate these creative moments is you have to actually work. You, like there's preparation involved to put information into your head about orbital mechanics or whatever it is mm -hmm. to actually allow for yourself to have an idea but then it feels to me sometimes like inspiration is required, which could come from literally anywhere. Mm. And so maybe this is just a way for me to rationalize doing things that are might otherwise be considered unproductive. <laughs> but, but doing things like breaking routine and yeah. consuming other kinds of media and reading weird books and doing stuff that's completely outside of your domain of, quote, expertise. Yeah, it shakes things up a little bit. Yeah, it sure. feels like it percolates things mm. or something. Mm. That makes mm -hmm. sense. And, and so the, well, the chills question, you know, again, I think it, um, for me at least, it comes down to the personal feeling of, of, of that, right? So if something gives you chills, I suppose, uh, it's, it's deeply personal, right? It really it wouldn't necessarily give anybody else chills, not just mm -hmm. this one idea I was talking about, but any other experience you might have. Uh, seeing something extraordinary for the first time, maybe looking down from the top of El Capitan or some, or some kind yeah. of, you know, remarkable physical experience, um, it, it comes down to you personally. Um, so it does seem like there's sort of a personal element to it, and you have to, therefore, to uh, you know, create uh, some kind of creative spark within yourself, you have to think about what it, what does that for you. And if it does involve reading a comic book or watching a movie or, or eating some spicy food or whatever it might be, yeah. that shakes things up a little bit. Maybe that's what it has to, has to do. It has to do with, again, your own... Um, you're intentionally trying to manipulate your own awareness or consciousness or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is really personal. But then at the same time, you have like thousands and thousands and thousands of people making pilgrimages to go look at 
whatever it is, some piece of art someplace. Yeah. And you, you can ask those people, what, why are you doing this? And the answers are usually unsatisfying. It's, it's, at least in my experience, it's kind of like, well, I don't really know. There's just, there's a sensation associated. Maybe, it's, maybe they describe it as chills or maybe it's, maybe it's a slightly different class of feeling. But there does seem to be some man-made things and some natural things that induce a, a particular sensation in a lot of people. Hmm. Enough so that it warrants putting them in a special place that people can go do that whenever they would like to. So I take it you you would believe that a, a digital version of that wouldn't have the same effect. Like if you just go see the Mona Lisa online, it's not going to impress you well, the same way. That's exactly what I've been. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know um, because I've been. What I've been. I've been asking people these sorts of questions a lot because what I would really love to figure out if is if there's any sort of pattern or common characteristic among those things which mm. induce the sensation in people. Because for me personally, and this might just be a personal thing, I very rarely get that feeling from engineered systems. Mm. And it's not clear to me why, because I sometimes feel like I should, but it's more rare. This, the sorts of, if we limit ourselves just to human-made things, the sorts of things that do that to me, very occasionally they're engineered, but more often mm. it's something a little bit different. And I don't know exactly what to make of that. Well, that's interesting. I mean, do you think it has to do with that, that you know a little too much about how these things work and so they're not as surprising as they might be for somebody else? I mean, someone it else can be. come across a – one of my favorite slash least favorite examples of an engineered system is there's there's a habit that folks have of creating what they call uh, human-like robots, which consists of basically a couple of motors and a big rubber mask. And then the eyes go left and right or something. We're supposed to respond to these things as if they're humans. And I'm not typically all that impressed by that. Mm -hmm. But I could imagine a person who doesn't know that there are three or four motors in there and a little, I don't know, a little microcontroller and maybe someone with a joystick moving the eyes back and forth. I can imagine that such a person would look at that and be really astonished. Mm -hmm. So somehow the magic is gone uh, for you. Like some, someone has lifted the veil uh, and, and exposed to the kind of grimy workings of uh, real engineered systems to the point where nothing impresses you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, but that could be the case. But then, so the nature of things that will often give me chills are things like I get them occasionally from paintings or mm -hmm. from music, stuff like yeah. this. And some of these things have the property where because I understand in principle how this was done, someone took paint and put it on the thing and then that made the painting. Maybe because I understand in principle how it was done, I can appreciate how amazing this particular example is yeah. in a way that I might not be able to appreciate with something that's engineered that it, but, you know, comes largely from, involves a bunch of stuff that I don't know as much about. Mm. I, I don't know. I, Maybe that's too simplistic. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. This morning I, I was listening to music and I heard the Dire Straits song, Brothers in Arms. And I don't know if I felt chills necessarily. Maybe it was close. But I remember the feeling of, that's so good. It was such a good song. <laughs> it's <laughs> so well done and surprising. And, and again, to me, somehow the surprise is involved in this. I don't think you can get chills looking at the same thing again, right? Yeah. It's only the, on the first time you encounter it that's really going to give you that feeling, right? I think that's it wears off, it seems. Hmm. Yeah. It happens with songs for sure. I remember hearing some songs for the first time, and I think, I'm never going to get tired of this. Yeah, and then, like, the next week, it's... <laughs> You're tired of it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I hadn't heard that Dire Straits album for probably 20 years, so yeah, that's probably part of it. Yeah. Um, it's a weird thing. And, you know, the other property that I found with some of these things is um, they have this strange ability to hold anyone's attention for very, very long periods of time. Hmm. I think, or maybe I'm just speaking too personally, but it seems like, you know, some sort of masterwork has this ability to captivate people. They can look at it for a long period of time. And it's not changing, but there's something about it that, that I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what it's doing. Well, this seems like a little bit of a different issue, uh, that there's a, something masterful about a, a really well-made artifact or a, a remarkably, you know, beautiful or interesting natural phenomenon or something like that, uh, that holds your interest. I guess I would interpret the, the chills issue as being an instantaneous one. Again, as if you're taken by surprise mm. or that it's um, unexpected, which is sort of the same thing, I guess. Uh, my point uh, is that I could see uh, watching uh, the sunset from my farm mm -hmm. for a long time 
or maybe my favorite example, I was uh, uh, sometime in mid-July this year. I was out there for the first time at that time of year, and this this old farm hasn't been uh, maintained for probably 70 years, and so it's just completely overgrown with six or seven foot tall brush, and it is chock full of lightning bugs, fireflies. Uh, so late at night when there's just no lights around either because this, this area uh, outside of town is, is really not developed. Um, the fireflies, it was just an absolute, uh, it was a bedlam of lights. Uh, I can't think of a better way to describe it. And I could have watched that for a long time. And my, my kid got sick of it, so <laughs> we left. But um, that, again, I don't know if that was a chills experience, but it was an experience that I was just captivated and I was happy to spend a really long time in the middle of this just entirely dark environment with, uh, you know, glittering life all around. It was just an ex extraordinary experience. So that's one that, you know, I get, I'll put it in the category right. uh, of extraordinary experiences. But not necessarily because I was surprised by it. And look, if, you, if you'd asked me, what are you going to see when you went? I'll probably see some fireflies. Yeah. I did think of you, though, when, when I was out there. Because <laughs> you did this uh, really cool experiment several years ago about uh, uh, taking our little tiny chip-sized spacecraft and having them interact as if they were fireflies and synchronizing their uh, their flashes. So I was actually kind of watching for that. Mm -hmm. I can't say I saw it, but I'm not saying it's not real. I just, I didn't see it. <laughs> the crickets here do that too. If you listen carefully, the snowy tree crickets uh, all synchronize their chirps mm. um, using essentially the same, it's hard to know if that algorithm is a model for the behavior or describes the behavior in a more fundamental sense, but... When you say model for, you're saying that they're trying to follow that model? I don't think so. Yeah, right? <laughs> I suppose that's it's true. It's got to be purely descriptive. Yeah. At the end of the day, I think a lot of things we take to be these sophisticated and really insightful models are just fairly simple expressions of things that nature figured out and it just, or not figured out, not the right, right word, but sort of fell into. And it took us some effort to get a mathematical model that that replicates that, you know, frankly, pretty straightforward idea. And we, we could go on and, and riff on this topic, but I, I'll put neural nets in that same general category. You know, it's a, a neural network is something like a, a set of interacting, uh, very simple mathematical expressions that by virtue of the way the network together can replicate some really subtle uh, phenomena, uh, maybe, like a human brain, uh, which is networked together through neurons. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really simple. And I think a lot of the kind of emergent behaviors that we see, so fireflies flashing uh, synchronously or, or crickets chirping synchronously or replicating the human brain through something as simple as a neural net, um, it works well because it's just ultimately not that complicated. Hmm. And we might find out that ultimately we're not all that complicated. And all the things that we're doing, you could probably come up with a you know, five or ten layer neural net, which pretty much captured it all. And I'd be disappointed to discover that, but that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, the um, it is surprising though, like math in particular. It's surprising how good math is at modeling mm. stuff that's going on in the universe. And do you credit math with that, or is it simply that we fell into uh, a uh, uh, kind of a, a structure, an architecture, you know, mathematics, which also is just as simple right. as the rest of the physics around us? I don't know. That like would have been sort of thinking about a little bit is, you know, suppose that folks were to discover this like holy grail theory of everything, some like mathematical sure. expression that describes how the whole universe evolved. Is that expression, is that mathematical expression a model for the universe or <laughs> is that more fundamentally the universe? Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. And does it, does it matter? <laughs> well, you know? <laughs> probably not, but, but yeah. And, it, and I, I guess maybe that's related to this question of, like, is math created or discovered? Yeah. Um. Well, I suppose in, so, I'm not a mathematician, although I play one from time to time on, in classes, you know, and students are willing to believe that I know more math than they do, although they're probably not right about that. Uh, but, you know, it seems to me that as you manipulate mathematical stuff, you might have the confidence uh, in the process um, enough confidence in that process that you that you believe your manipulations will lead you to a place of greater understanding of some other part of the physical world that it's meant to correspond to, right? So, 
you could start with some very basic mathematical principles, basic algebraic principles about sets and relations among them and operations and all sorts of stuff like this and, and build up this large, complicated architecture and in the process discover that you have also replicated a behavior that you see in the natural world. And I suppose what that says is that mathematics is kind of the language of, of the physical world. Mm -hmm. It's just that we maybe, since it's a little unnatural to us in the way that we have to come to mathematics, like we're not really, you know, we are both more and less sophisticated than mathematics in our own, you know, brains. Maybe we don't really see it as the simple thing that it really is. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so when we, when we develop these complicated mathematical equations about things, say, for example, a set of differential equations that very successfully uh, model the ways in which bacteria multiply and fill spaces, right? You can imagine models of something like this. And, and right now I know you're thinking of how, how you would code this up. And, yeah, it's totally codable, right? You could do this. Because I think at the end of the day, bacteria are pretty simple things. I mean, um, there will be some molecular biologists who will disagree with that. But I think when you look at their kind of behaviors and, and how they – do their thing, how they uh, work is a little like, you know, a little like evolution. I mean, it's not like it's this complicated theory. It's just the consequence of very straightforward principles being applied. Anyway, when you come up with these complicated mathematical models, uh, at some point, do you depart from the natural world? Like, is there really no natural process that's all that complicated? And maybe, right, right. M maybe it's hopeless you could come up with some super bizarre and complicated set of equations and ideas that ultimately doesn't map to anything useful or, or real. Or it could be down the road, you have actually figured out something important about how uh, interactions happen. And there's plenty of examples of this throughout the history of science of people either fooling around with math and saying, hey, you know what, this actually maps to something. Uh, for example, a certain differential equation turns out to, hey, that actually models how heat propagates in a system. Didn't know that. Or you go the other direction. You know, the, the original math problem, the original physics problem was always astronomy, right? It was always what the hell's going on with all these things moving around in the sky. That motivated most of the development of uh, physics and, and mathematics uh, early on. Um, it could be that it's through experimentation that you are motivated to find a model. So I guess what I'm saying is there's a couple of different threads here. One is you could pull on the thread of keep messing around with the math and don't even worry about the physics, mm -hmm. and eventually you might find out that you have an interesting model that happens to explain something physical, and that's convenient. Or the other way around, is um, keep looking at the physical world and then keep trying to model it. You'll get closer and closer and closer until you maybe actually figure it out. Um, if it can be figured out. If it, well, and that's I guess, a great question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess what I'm contending here is not some sort of simple Newtonian framework where everything has straightforward cause and effect. I mean, after all, that violates quantum mechanics. We know that that's not quite the way the world works. But there are math mathematical representations of quantum mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can get at a lot of the physical world with... Uh, with mathematics, even if it doesn't follow some sort of straightforward cause and effect relationship. Yeah. Well, this is quite a riff on that initial question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know well, where we're going with that. To continue with just a little bit more, I just you've brought to mind that I have noticed in, in speaking of complicated mathematical equations, I have noticed that when you present an equation like that to a group of people, there's a fight or flight response usually. <laughs> yeah, there's, it's a it's perceptible in the room. Right? There's a story there. I want to hear the fight story. But <laughs> it, it keep going. But but there is a like a this feeling of like oh god, you uh -huh. know, which I think is interesting because I it's a bummer actually I think mm -hmm. um, because I agree with you that math feels to me like the language of the universe mm -hmm. and. So I've been trying to conduct this experiment where you, you show this complicated expression and if you ask folks to like personify that equation, like, like take that equation and imagine like the human representation of that equation, what does it look like? And it's often like a bully, you know, mm. because it feels like often it's the case that math is presented in such a way that it is something that uh, is to be overcome. It's something that stands in your way in order to get to some objective. Mm. Um, the experiment I've been trying is let's pretend, let's change that personification from a bully to pretend that this is someone that you love deeply that doesn't speak the same language as you and is trying to tell you something really important. Because um, I feel like that's a more correct way to think about the language of the universe. This, this complicated mathematical expression, it looks scary. It It loves you in some sense. It's describing something that you love and that is very important to, to everyone 
and it's doing its absolute best to communicate this to you. And uh, it's, it's, it's not always productive, but for some people this can change the way that they look at these things where suddenly you start, instead of treating this, instead of treating math like a bully, you start treating it like someone that you love who's trying to tell you something. And with someone that you love that's trying to tell you something, you're patient. Yeah. Like you let, you let them take their time and you work with them to try to get the information out. So it's, um, first I assume that since you're experimenting as students, you went through the internal review board for, <laughs> for clearly a fixed reasons. Uh, no, it sounds like what you're doing is you're peeling away uh, years of unfortunate academic training, which puts you at, in kind of an adversarial relationship with your subject of study or your object of study, right? In fact, the whole idea of subject and object where you're sort of acting upon the object, uh, that, that does kind of displace you in an, in an uncomfortable way from the thing you're studying. And if you didn't have that relationship, if it was instead more of a collaborative one, you use love as the, uh, as, as the metaphor, uh, yeah, you might actually have different results, different outcomes. Do you find that it's, you said that it works for some people and not others. Do you find that by the time a person is, a, I don't know, a sophomore or junior or whatever in the classes you're teaching, do you find that they're um, receptive to this or do they just want to get their grade and move on? <laughs> I think it's more busyness and stress levels. Really? I, I think if you're, I don't know. I'm, I'm purely speculating at this point. I can't substantiate any of this, but it seems to me like if stress levels exceed some threshold, you it's just non-linearly more difficult to to approach problems in math like this because your whole consciousness is subsumed with, I got to get this done and I got to get this done yeah. and I got to get this done. And it just do, it doesn't, it makes it a lot harder. Well, there's I lots think. of baggage, right, yeah. associated with an academic enterprise. If you're teaching a class or you're taking a class, there's so much more going on than simply learning. You know, I, I'm not sure what fraction it is, but I'm going to say 75% of the process of taking a class is not learning. It's the mechanics of the class. You know, you wish it weren't that way, but there's also just subtly like, how are you interacting with your classmates? How are you interacting with the, let's say, lab hardware if it's a lab class? Or yeah. are, are you worried about the test coming up? What about my grades? And, you know, is my penmanship okay? I and mean, there's all sorts of yeah. things that get in the way of learning. I'm not sure if there's a purer version of how you would teach a class, but um, maybe maybe love is at the core of it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, and I, th and I think that, this can apply to some engineered systems as well, where you look at a complicated engineered structure and uh, view it as something that loves you in some sense and approach it as such. We have to believe it loves you, right? Yeah. Like we have to believe other people in our lives love us yeah. and despite evidence to the contrary sometimes. Yeah. Sure. Have you ever seen an engineered thing and been completely struck by its beauty in the way that you might be struck by the beauty of fireflies or a piece of art or something like that? You know, not... Often, at least in the terms I think you're you're asking about it, I think um, if I understand your your point is something like the beauty of the engineering itself, like the the cleverness with which it's put together or the elegance of the solution as such, right? It's not quite w what I find myself responding to often. I mean, maybe I should. It feels like I should respond to that, <laughs> but um, I will say that maybe I've been spoiled a little bit by. Uh, movies and art and other things that or other forms of art that depict these really next to unachievable futures uh, where uh, elegant and really effective robots, let's say, uh, represented in CGI have mostly transparent bits and pieces and a little bit of shiny chrome here and there and no detectable power supply or, or the kind of lubricants and all mm -hmm. the kind of junk that probably has to go along with an engineered system. And we kind of take for granted, maybe at this point, having seen enough uh, popular culture representations of engineered systems, that things should be fairly elegant and, and aesthetically beautiful. Because, I mean, after all, these fictional things, uh, someone came up with them because they're, they want them to be beautiful, first and foremost. If they had a kind of ugly looking or, or goofy looking design, I don't think it would appeal quite as much. And, and someone at some point in the production would say, that, yeah, make that look cooler. Mm -hmm. So just looking cool might. Uh, be the reason why those things look that way. And that's different, probably, from what would work well in an engineered mm -hmm. context. I mean, often the most elegant solution from an engineering perspective is not, does not look cool. Uh, if you'll permit me to go back to this example I was offering, this is on my mind, of this um, gravity gradient force thing, okay? So we have a spacecraft, it's in orbit, it's very large, 
and uh, the the forces that act on the let's say extreme ends of this object, some of which are responsible for propelling it forward, are also propel uh, responsible for for torquing it for causing it to tilt in a way that we don't want because it turns out you have to keep this thing kind of leaning relative to gravity for it to work well. Anyway, uh, so you have to come up with a way of counteracting the torque that's imparted. And the way you would probably do that in Earth orbit is with, with magnetism. So you'd have this thing lean against the magnetic field. In some sense, what's, what would be going on is you'd be turning the torque from the magnetic field into thrust, kind of indirectly because the magnetic torque counteracts the gravity gradient torque, they sum to zero, and you're left with force, which is an interesting notion. Mm. Um, it's not really correct in a physics sense, but it, operationally it's true. Um, early on, I made some animations of this, um, some little CGI animations, and shared them with uh, the folks I was doing the research with, because I thought they would appreciate what I'm talking about if I could just show them a, a physical system. It's very hard to gesture about three-dimensional orbit mechanics. I can't quite do it. <clears throat> Um, instead, I think they look kind of cool, and then people got sort of, they sort of fell in love with the, the shape that I had drawn, even though that was not really realistic, to the point where they couldn't get out of their heads a little bit and, and actually engineer the right answer, which I don't think looks exactly like what I was, in fact, nothing like what I, what I created in my little afternoon of, of animation. Uh, so, you know, in that, in that example, I think the attempt to communicate the functionality of this engineered system through somewhat glitzy graphics actually worked against the need for elegance or at least correctness <laughs> in the uh, in the design of this thing. Hmm. Uh, so all, all that is to say, you know, do I appreciate uh, engineered systems and do I respond to them uh, in a way that you might respond to art or at least uh, do I appreciate the artifice, that is to say the, the, the work behind them? I, I guess I do, but I don't know that it bowls me over. And maybe I'm in the wrong job. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I just, I, maybe, again, it's because the, the veil has been lifted. Mm -hmm. I know what goes into it. I know it's, you know, a lot of drudgery for years and years uh, for people who, you know, s occasionally have sparks of inspiration, but most of the time it's just plodding along and, and checking all the things that need to get checked and, doing boring stuff like working out Gantt charts for the project manager and making sure it's on budget. And, and ultimately, when I think of all that stuff, a lot of the enthusiasm just, just sort of drains out of me. <laughs> and so I look at a, a complicated and really brilliant system like, let's say, the International Space Station. I, and my first response is, maybe, yeah, that's an amazing thing. And also, man, that took a lot of work. Sure. You know, <laughs> that's a, it's different from appreciating the, you know, obviously very successful engineering that underlies it. Uh, an interesting example for uh, ISS, for the space station, is... Uh, that it flies in a particular orientation that cancels out disturbances. So those disturbances could be solar radiation pressure, it could be gravity gradient torque, which I mentioned a second ago, uh, could be all sorts of other things. And so, uh, oh, atmospheric drag, lots, lots of things. If you figure out the, 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 the magnitude, the direction of all these forces and torques and so forth, and discover an attitude, an orientation for the ISS to fly in, that sums all those to zero, that's the best one to fly in because then you don't need extra propellant or power or whatever to deal with all those torques. And that's a, that's a brilliant and elegant solution. It's also virtually invisible. Like mm -hmm. if you see ISS, you're going to see it, let's say, coming over the horizon. You see a little bit of the, maybe a little bit of the upper atmosphere of Earth just because it's pretty, you know, and maybe you see some lights below illuminating southern France or something and it looks very pretty. But you don't appreciate that what's at the core of this is a fairly elegant and interesting mathematical solution. You're just never going to see it. So I think a lot of what makes uh, engineered systems potentially beautiful is also invisible. And you have to look pretty hard and pretty deeply, and maybe it's a little bit like uh, the acquired taste of a fine wine. You kind of have to yeah. <laughs> come to it in a way that's um, not something that everybody will do. So, you know, maybe not everyone can fully appreciate that. Where I do think, uh, let's say, the natural world, and even most art, I think most people can appreciate. Another way of saying that is that art that takes fine-tuning to appreciate, I don't think is quite as successful. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, there are paintings, let's say, a huge rectangle of red as a painting. I think I can maybe appreciate that. But it's because I've been around and I've seen some things and maybe that's, I can understand where that's coming from. I think a general person coming across that or a kid, let's say, would say, that's red. 
and walk away and not be impressed by it. Right. So I don't know that art that requires training is necessarily the most successful. And so by the same token, engineering systems or engineered systems, unless they're obviously beautiful in the way that science fiction robots and spacecraft tend to be, I don't know that they are they are successful examples of beauty. Yeah. So if I'm trying to figure out if this is even a reasonable <laughs> question, but okay. like suppose that someone approached you or some other engineer and said, "We would like for you to make something for the Louvre that would sort of sit in among these other things that that could be appreciated by anyone, don't require domain knowledge." Do you think a property of that engineered system would be that anyone could look at it and sort of understand rather fundamentally how it's doing whatever it's doing like there would be no is part of it sort of um you would you it would not require domain knowledge to appreciate it yeah maybe okay. uh maybe so i can think of an interesting counterexample to my, <laughs> my hypothesis okay so uh saw this in santa fe probably 25 years ago an artist had made uh clay models of little little pigs with wings and uh, hung them from the ceiling on kind of like a, like a carousel. And they were actually suspended from strings. And spun this around and then turned on a strobe light. Each little pig with its wings was in a different phase of the flapping. So as you look up at it with the strobe light all timed correctly, you see what amounts to a clay figure flapping its wings. Hmm. And of course you see many of them because they're all doing the same thing around the circle. But you look at one and you see this you've essentially animated what couldn't be animated. You've animated a clay thing. That was, I remember that now, 25 years later. I probably don't remember anything else I saw in that entire exhibit uh, because of the innovative nature of it. So I think innovation is one of those things that people uh, do respond to. Um, and maybe you call that beautiful. I don't know, maybe innovation is beautiful. Mm -hmm. But that seemed really innovative to me. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a, another, there's a, uh, another kind of museum in Santa Fe is called Meow Wolf, which is a um, kind of an art installation that's uh, f sponsored in part by um, uh, by what's his name the uh, the the author of Game of Thrones, uh, J.R.R. Martin, right? Wait, okay. No, right. I'm, I'm missing up his first name. Anyway. George. George R.R. Martin. Yeah. I know. I think of J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> any any good fantasy writer has two R's in the middle name, right? So anyway, George R.R. Martin. A thing called Meow Wolf. I think that artists, uh, their work is actually represented there as well. There's a lot of innovation there. So I think in, in the Louvre example you're asking about, I think if I had that opportunity, I would try to create something surprising, something new. Uh, the alternative, of course, is to do something really well, like a really photorealistic, hyper-realistic painting. I don't have the skill for that. Mm -hmm. But even if I did, I'm not sure how, how surprising that would be to anyone because it's kind of been done. I guess I really respond well to things that are, that are new that are uh, surprising again. Yeah. You, you've reminded me of, uh, I had one, we did one laboratory assignment in a class here that stuck with me in exactly the same way, where it was vibrating a beam, uh -huh. and there was a strobe light on the beam, and by changing the frequency of the strobe light, it animated every mode. Oh, that's cool. And it was just, it was <laughs> stunning. I'd never seen anything like uh -huh. it, and I think about it like, <laughs> once every couple months or something. Like it still comes back to my consciousness regularly because it was showing me something that was happening but that I had I had never been privy to before. It was just hidden from me. Right. But it was happening the whole time. Um, so that's that's part of it, right? It's exposing what's hidden. And maybe there's a certain glee that we have in discovering what's hidden. And sometimes discovering what's hidden means discovering a new thing. Um, you know, sometimes it's having a deep understanding of the thing. So maybe that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a question about your – this thing that you noticed where you generated the animation and it sort of oh, affected yeah. the the engineering in sort of a, a non-productive way. Yeah. Uh, it reminded me of – I know when Carl Sagan made that message to Mars down in – by the Ithaca Falls. Hmm. And he said that – he says something along the lines of uh, – the notion of the message is it goes to Mars. It lives there. It will be listened to by whoever gets there first. So it's on a, you know, they can listen to it, but we can listen to it on YouTube. And uh, in it, he's, he describes science and science fiction has, as having done a dance for the past decades. Hmm. And um, I'm curious if you've seen that dance play out in your own life or in any of your own projects where si instead of sort of, uh, in this case, I suppose, your own science fiction animation sort of worked against the engineering. Have you seen it go the other direction? Oh, for sure. Uh, when I was at NASA... 
this is now 10 years ago, um, we tried to kick off a project in which we uh, came up with a formal process to find innovation in science fiction. It's clear that that can happen, right? It's clear that people propose things that ultimately become real. I mean, there's the famous example, probably apocryphal, of the, uh, of the communicator from Star Trek influencing the design of, of, of flip phones. Okay, so it may be true, maybe not, but nevertheless, notionally, people uh, in, the, in the arts come up with ideas uh, and maybe not more or less than others come up with ideas, but they definitely come up with ideas, present them in a way that's compelling, and can inspire people to work on that. Um, so the, the notion that uh, fiction could inspire, uh, I don't want to say productive work, but you know, mm -hmm. uh, could, could inspire a real engineering systems, I think is a perfectly sound and well-established one. And, uh, and you have to say that sort of thing in the context of NASA because as a government agency, you know, NASA can't really take on stuff that's completely frivolous and foolish and, and we don't want to look like fools for, for doing it. So there's, a, I think, fairly sound justification for trying to mine ideas out of fiction. So the, the notion, at least, was why don't, why don't we come up with a way of doing this? Now, does that require, I don't know, some kind of AI machine learning to read through millions of pages of science fiction or do you just put a bunch of people in a room and ask, what's your favorite thing from science fiction? Um, we never quite figured that out. Mm -hmm. But it's also pretty clear that there are ideas to to mine there. Uh, I could list my maybe top crazy ideas that are in science fiction that no one's ever put into practice, as far as I know. Um, I won't, but let me know if you want to talk about that. Uh, but in terms of, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, one, that's one example of maybe where I tried making this actually happen. There certainly are more passive versions of that, where I suppose one is inspired by certain aspects of science fiction. One of them, I think, that probably appeals to the adolescent in all of us is this notion of um, independence or uh, you know, self-reliance that arises in the way that we uh, architect spacecraft. So this is problematic because, in my opinion, the right way to build a spacecraft or even a space system architecture is to incorporate infrastructure at the same time. So from here to Mars, you could take the Conestoga wagon approach of load up all your, your salt pork and your dog and, and, your, and your family and a bunch of chairs and the Bible and whatever and just head out west and go toward Mars and then set up a homestead there. That's certainly one way to go. And that has a certain appeal to it. Again, kind of an adolescent appeal. Where I don't need anyone's help. I can just do this on my own. But instead, I think that you probably want to have fuel depots along the way. You want to have a communications infrastructure in place. You want to have a navigation infrastructure in place, essentially interplanetary GPS. Um, there's lots of things you'd like to have. And in fact, we will have soon. You know, and I'm, you're probably aware NASA has contracted with Nokia and a couple of others to provide what amounts to LTE communications for cislunar space. Mm -hmm. It makes sense that we would be able to leverage terrestrial technology to make it possible, in fact, not just possible, but easy, to travel and uh, thrive in space. So that's, that is happening now. But that's very much a paradigm shift. It used to be the case that we think of, let's send a probe out and we'll sort of hold our breath and we get the data back and then we're good. It's like Apollo, right? It's like run to the moon, grab some rocks, run back. And great, great accomplishment. I th mean to throw no shade on mm -hmm. Apollo, uh, but also that was the product of its time. And now here we are 60 years later, uh, we should be able to do better and we can. Uh, and it's going to be infrastructure that makes that possible. So the overall construct that I'm describing here is one where really you want spacecraft to be part of a community. It sort of takes a village, I guess, to to, to really run a spacecraft right, run a space mission or a space infrastructure or a space community. But that wasn't always the case. So there is um, there's a lot of science fiction out there that's based on this idea of one person gets in a rocket and goes and does a thing and is a great big hero. It's a nice narrative, but it's also probably not the real narrative of, of our, our time. Um, take uh, one of my favorite science fiction uh, series, uh, The Expanse. I don't know if you've ever seen this show. I haven't. Okay, so it's in the last few years. A really uh, Originally a set of novels, really, really compelling uh, and very well done. They get all the, the science and the math right, and they're just so grateful. You know, one of the things they do is this turn and burn maneuver. So say you're going from here to Mars. And you want to go there fast because, after all, no one wants to take eight months to get to Mars. It might take that in, you know, for our first try. But as we get better at it, it'll take less time. You don't want to spend a lot of time because you got to have food and, and drink for that eight months, which is not trivial. 
uh, astronauts need to survive the radiation environment, or you have to have a huge amount of shielding, and there's a lot of other issues around that. And just as a matter of practicality, you know, eight months, there's a lot of time for people to get unhealthy and for things to go wrong. So you want to go fast. So the faster you go, the safer, probably. In the expanse, the turn and burn uh, approach is you turn on these thrusters, a, uh, a type of thruster we don't have. I guess it's called the Epstein drive or something. Anyway, turn on these thrusters, and they just really apply a lot of thrust, like three or four Gs or more of acceleration. I'm not sure how much the human body can take, but in the expanse, the, the TV series, and, and I guess the novels, I've not read the novels, uh, people get injected with some fluid to allow them to withstand this. It's a whole thing. Okay. So there's a lot of thought put uh, behind this. If they didn't have to worry about that, <laughs> they could just refuel from time to time on the way to Mars and then use chemical propulsion for the purposes that you'd want to use it for. It would maybe make sense to do that. Uh, but just for the hell of it, uh, I decided to do a turn and burn project this semester with a couple of Master of Engineering students and an undergrad. So the turn and burn project consists of you fire the thrusters super hard for like half the journey, and then you turn around and then fire the thruster for the other half in the other opposite direction. So you speed up, and then you slow down. You start at zero speed, you end at zero speed, uh, start at Earth, end at Mars. Uh, it's kind of a classic uh, Hamilton, Jacoby Bellman, uh, Hamilton, Jacoby Bellman optimality kind of a thing, where you stomp on the gas to go the fastest, and that, that becomes time optimal. So long answer to your question here, I know. But what I'm getting at is we did actually do one of these things. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, a useful exercise for students to take on a problem where, first of all, there is no answer. There, this can't be done. Right? To be clear, this is impossible. But what would make it possible? I think that's really the interesting question, and it's actually where, it, where this question of how does science fiction influence engineering, where it comes from. We see something extraordinary in science fiction, and we know it's not possible because it doesn't exist right now. But then we, as engineers, ask ourselves, well, what would make that possible? What technologies, what are the gaps that need to get filled? And if there are things like we have to invent a faster-than-light means of communication so that we can have the Ansible, which we use to communicate across space without any delay, well, that's an impediment that I don't think we can solve because that's in the realm of physics. It's not really in the realm of engineering. But most other problems that arise in science fiction, or at least that are posed by science fiction ideas, are in fact technological in nature, and you could get at them. Hmm. You could beat down the, those technical risks with a sufficient budget and expertise. So in the case of turn and burn, lots of issues arise. Let me ask you, what do you think issues arise in this problem? So I have a thruster now that's using, you know, it's more or less known physics, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not like it's some kind of warp drive thing, right? So what, what, what do you think are problems that we would have to address? And the, the notion is that you just slam on the gas till halfway, turn yep. around and slam on the yeah, gas. Yeah, roughly halfway. Now, the rocket equation is in, in play, so you're going to use up some propellant, so it's actually a little bit less than halfway, yeah. but you turn it on, but yeah. It the, seems to me that that you need, am I correct that you need a lot of work on the nature of the way that we do propulsion because you'd run out of gas rather right. quickly, I imagine, with a conventional chemical propulsion. Yes, yeah, so that's true. So if it's chemical or well, any kind of propulsion, right, the amount of propellant you carry uh, is dependent on how much propellant you have, right, because you, you need to carry the gas to carry the gas to carry yeah. the gas. All right, so, uh, so there's that problem, the rocket equation problem. Uh, there's a thing called specific impulse, which I know you know, uh, and that's uh, the um, the amount of force you get for how much stuff you're throwing out the back of the spacecraft. So it's the force divided by mass flow rate. The the specific impulse is a matter of fiction, right? Here, we, we know that there is no thruster capable of three Gs of acceleration for longer than a few seconds to minutes. That's what, you know, rockets that lift off the surface of the Earth are capable of, so... That's, we know that that can happen for that amount of time. And in that case, the rockets are mostly propellant. You know, the SpaceX Starship, mostly propellant. Cool-looking vehicle. It's just a big gas can, essentially, <laughs> right? Uh, with a lot of other cool stuff on it. All right, so, yeah, one issue is what the propellant's going to be. So what I did, and it's interesting talking to the students about this because, sadly, I think they've been trained to think that the job of an engineer is to start with requirements and then use a formulas that you know well plug in the numbers, and come up with the answer. That certainly is a process that happens. It's also not the process but where by anyone invents anything or develops any technology. So, you know, I, I told the students involved here, okay, so let's just say, let's take the most extreme version of 
uh, specific impulse I can come up with, which is this thing called positron catalyzed fusion propulsion. Long story, I didn't invent it, but the specific impulse there is something like 3 million or 30 million seconds. It's, it's extreme. The particles come out at relativistic speeds. So, okay, let's say that that's the case. So, yeah, let's say that that's not, let's not say that we're trying to solve that problem. We're trying to design that, but we say that's the scale of the problem. After all, we couldn't have propulsion that produces particles that travel faster than the speed of light. So there is a limit here about mm -hmm. how much thrust you can ever get. So that's certainly one. Mm -hmm. Let's say that we're, in fact, doing that. In, in the process, we're applying power, right, because there's a change in kinetic energy involved. If nothing else, the vehicle is traveling at faster and faster speeds, so its kinetic energy is changing. Anytime you change kinetic energy, that's power, right? And anytime you use power for anything, it's imperfect, so you're going to lose some power. The more power you apply, the more you lose, even if, let's say, it's 95% efficient. You're losing that 5%. That 5% is going to go to heat. So now the question is, how hot does this thing get? And it gets really hot. <laughs> so we are bounded by the physics of you know, thermal engineering, we mm -hmm. are bounded by the physics of relativity on, on the other side for the, this. But still within that, there is a space, a design space. You can continue with this whole process and figure out just where are the bounds, where are the technology gaps, and you can actually work your way into what it would look like. And what we're coming up with, there's a roadmap for if you had the technology, how would you actually do a turn and burn? Hmm. And it's not obvious. One interesting implication is, let's say that you're trying to uh, fire these rocket engines to leave Earth. Maybe you're leaving from the surface of the Earth. More likely, you're learning, leaving from a space station. If you just fire that rocket engine with a space station in the background, you punch a relativistic <laughs> hole through it with this massive beam of high-energy particles, right? That's not going to be welcome. You know, that's like like firing up your big diesel truck in the in the in the garage uh, mm -hmm. of your neighbor's house. Uh, that's not welcome. So. You can't do that. You have to start off maybe at a little bit of an angle, and there's a whole sorts of things that happen that um, that an engineer or a technologist would be able to spot, but that start with the inspiration of fiction. Um, if the turn and burn scenario hadn't been articulated pretty successfully in The Expanse, I don't think we would have been able to you know, easily discuss hmm. the rest of the story. Hmm. Very long answer to your question, I'm sorry. But th th there is definitely... Uh, there's plenty of ideas in science fiction and just fiction in general, speculative fiction, let's say, mm -hmm. that could offer us guide rails. Uh, guide rails for space exploration, sure. Um, also from a society perspective, you know, a social perspective. A lot of science fiction and speculative fiction generally is focused on questions of how we will live. What are humans like in the future? Sometimes we have the same foibles, the same greediness, the same self-centeredness, the same failure to communicate. All those things are still part of humanity, presumably, in the future. There may come a time a million years hence when somehow <clears throat> that stuff evolves out of us, but we're not there yet. So a lot of that fiction sort of examines that and comes up with you know, alternative ways of, of working and living, which is interesting. Yeah. It's fascinating, too, how it seems like even relatively old fiction has valuable ideas in it. It's true. D despite the fact that, you know, there's been so much technology introduced in the meantime. I'm thinking in particular of like Jules Verne, you yeah. know, with his big gun. Yep. I, I, there are companies popping out with very similar ideas to the one that's articulated exactly in Jules Verne's book. Earth to the Moon, yep. Yeah. Uh, that's a great example. Uh, probably, if you go back farther and farther in the past, you definitely find interesting and creative solutions um, but I also think that as we come forward in history and looking at science fiction solutions, they're better informed by the state of the art, and the amount of extrapolation is even that much more valuable. So you could take H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, okay? Notionally, I mean, there was basically no discussion of how the time machine actually works, because frankly, it probably couldn't work, mm -hmm. okay? But even if it could, he had no idea how it would work. Um, but that wasn't important. It was really about people and society and people doing the same stupid things uh, generation or millennia after millennia. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't really about that. And neither was Earth to the Moon, by the way. It was about something else. It was really about people and, and exploration and other things. But anyway, um, the the fact is, you know, the time machine is a great, great example. It was the, f as far as I know, maybe it wasn't, but it was the first example of that. Frankenstein, another arguably science fiction book, right? Mary Shelley. Um, it wasn't really, again, about 
uh, how to make uh, the uh, you know the monster. It was actually you know more about what it means to be human mm -hmm. and what do we owe each other as people and you know, what's good and evil. Uh, and and are, some people argue the the dangers of technology. I'm not sure it's actually what the book's about. But anyway, um, as we come forward in time, uh, you could take a look at uh, William Gibson. Okay, so uh, cyberpunk, the original cyberpunk author, his work is set in a way that um, presupposes a computer environment, which we now more or less take for granted, right? Mm -hmm. The internet is, is virtually the, the kind of pseudo environment of, uh, of, of his world. That, um, that's helpful as a starting point because mm -hmm. despite all sorts of earlier science fiction notions of what computers are all about, none of them really predicted the way that they was, it would turn out. So thanks to William Gibson, we can maybe see some extrapolations now into other things. Uh, for example, he was one of the folks who uh, first laid out how uh, augmented reality could, could work in, in a practical environment a decade before really we start to see it uh, really happen. Hmm. Um, so, uh, it was called... I'm going to forget the name, but it has the word ghost in the title. Anyway, terrific novel that actually talks about how augmented reality becomes functionally part of how humanity uh, works, and I think we're seeing that now. So I think a lot of the extrapolations are more valuable when uh, they're informed by the state of the art. Sure. And I also think that, that the converse of that is interesting. When we see unsuccessful science fiction, like the famous example of the movie Gravity, which gets virtually every aspect of orb mechanics dead wrong, um, you, you can kind of tell, it kind of smells wrong, and, you, and it's not just that it doesn't maybe look right to the naked eye, or it's clearly not right from a science perspective, it's more that what we see there is an unsuccessful attempt to set something in a world where the science and technology matter. Clearly they can't matter, because they're all wrong. So what are we supposed to take from that? How seriously can we take the lessons from a, from a, a piece of art that just doesn't get the basics right? Yeah, you know, that, I guess maybe this is the curse or blessing, maybe, of having some technical experience, which a lot of people have now. Uh, they have a sense of how computers work. Uh, when we evaluate or come to art and uh, try to evaluate it, if someone's getting the the science and technology wrong, we kind of dismiss it. It's just a little unpleasant. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. You know, even in gravity, though, as as silly as some of sort of the engineering and physics of that was. Uh, there were a handful of human moments in that movie that oh, I still sure. really... There's one in particular where George Clooney's character is, like, floating away. He's just sacrificed himself, and he talks about, like, oh, you should see the sun on the Ganges or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. that Those sorts of human moments, even in these sort of somewhat more silly science fiction stories, um, I still like them for that reason. And I, maybe I'm just particularly good mm -hmm. at suspension of disbelief. I don't know. I wonder if there there's a sort of contrast that's interesting, too. So you mentioned Blade Runner, yeah, right? So in the original Blade Runner 1982, I guess, um, there's not that much technology that is um, really in your face in that. It's a dystopian world, right? And there's some sort of passive technology, like the fact that cars can float. Okay, we'll take that for granted. It's just part of the future. Sure, why not? The other, of course, obvious piece of technology is the genetic or bioengineering or maybe synthetic biology that's at the core of these replicants, these robot-like humans mm -hmm. uh, who are more or less human, but not quite because they're they're manufactured. And yet they're also, they also either have a soul or want to have a soul. And the interesting question is, you know, what is life and what does it mean to be human? And um, and there's there's questions in that that movie, or not not so much the novel by Philip K. Dick, but in the movie, about whether uh, Rick Deckard is in fact a replicant himself. An interesting open question. But anyway, the uh, one of the things that's uh, uh, similarly moving is the contrast between this this really off-putting dystopian future world with you know crowded with uh, people and also technologies that uh, are kind of inaccessible but somehow integrated into everyday life. And the very last moments of Roy Batty, who is uh, the, the kind of strongest and the leader of the replicants, if you remember this, mm -hmm. um, he's dying and he kind of plays a cat and mouse game with Harrison Ford's character, Rick Deckard, uh, for the last, I don't know, 20 minutes of the movie or something like that, chasing around and gunshots being fired and all sorts of blood and gore and all sorts of good stuff like that. But um, at the end, he can't kill Deckard because he's about to die himself and he suddenly, so, suddenly somehow appreciates life in a way he never did and has this wonderful speech about uh, all the memories that he's had as a, as, a, as a robot that humans will never see or that he, uh, Deckard, definitely won't see. You know, uh, various views of space and things that he's experienced. 
Um, is that the Tannhauser Gate speech? That's, that is that speech. Okay. And uh, at the end, he says, all these moments will be lost like tears in the rain. It's a very moving speech and a very moving moment. And none of it requires technology, but I think it's the contrast, honestly, between a technologically off-putting environment and that deeply human moment. And that's where I think science fiction can be very successful. There's other examples like Avatar and James Cameron mm -hmm. involved in lots of these things um, that are successful for that reason. And I think that when science fiction works well, it is because there's a human element that people can respond to. I think having an entirely technologically correct but maybe not too compelling mm -hmm. story is just not going to be a successful Mm -hmm. story but I don't know what that means I don't know if it means that that's a way to teach people or bring them in right. to technology or if it's a way to bring technology out to people you know one of the like engineering things that I think I took away from Blade Runner and I would say Alien 2 is um, as dystopian as sort of both of the futures were that they represented there's something about the mechanical nature of the technology in those movies It's there's very few screens it's a lot of buttons and switches and mechanical yeah. interacting with things. And I don't know why. Maybe it's just because there's so many screens in, like, the world that we live yeah. in. But I find that very attractive. <laughs> I, I like the aesthetic of it. And, like, when I'm thinking about building things, I, I have a little bit of an inclination to lead unnecessarily towards mechanical interfaces as yeah. opposed to screen-based interfaces. Even when it's not as practical, just... It might not be the right answer technically, but there's something about the tactile nature of the future that they portray yeah. that feels good to me. I don't know exactly why. I think you're onto something. I think certainly in trying to appreciate a human's, a person's interaction with technology, seeing them push buttons and pull levers and all that, and yeah. uh, have to walk through Jeffrey's tubes and other things that happen in the Star Trek universe, you know that that communicates. Uh, an intimacy, a connection between the people and the things that they care about. If everything could just be done by you know swiping up and down on a screen, that, that we've defeated the Klingons. You yeah, know, that, that's a lot less <laughs> impact on an narrative yeah. basis. You know, speaking of Star Trek, the uh, the most interesting encounter I ever had with like a science fiction person was when Morgan Gendel came to mm -hmm. to tour the lab. Who's the guy who wrote the famous episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation that involves um, Picard learning to play the flute. He gets yeah. sort of zapped, learns to play the flute. I won't spoil the it's ending. It's called Inner Light. Inner Light. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, uh, I was showing him some of the stuff around the lab, and we were working on these tiny little satellites, basically little printed circuit boards outfitted to with satellite stuff, and put it in his hand, and his eyes got huge, and he looked at me and said, could these block out the sun? <laughs> <laughs> and it was just such an interesting, like, the direction that his brain was going with thinking of extrapolating technology was so different from anything that I'd experienced yeah. in, you know, our little engineering world. Um, it was fascinating, right? It, it was really, really interesting. So uh, you're suggesting that a science fiction writer's perspective is one that can really help us uh, understand Maybe. what yeah. forward in technology. Yeah, yeah. You know, the other, um, the other idea from science fiction that I really like is from... Isaac Asimov has a short story. Maybe it became a longer book. I don't know. The Sentinel? You ever read that? I don't remember. You have to remind it's, me. Uh, so the notion is that we – it takes place in, in a future in which people are starting to sort of mine the moon and do digging on the moon for whatever they're doing. And they discover a um, non-natural thing. I forget exactly what it is. It's like an obelisk-type thing. But in any case, they uncover it, and they're kind of poking around and figuring out what this thing is, and it turns on. And the story ends with this notion of, uh, well, whatever put this here is on its way. The thing, the thing was put in place for sake of laying dormant until it was activated by an intelligence as sort of a, hmm. um, a watchdog for intelligence. And so this notion of – well, it's a little bit of a different notion, but of – intentional interstellar or interplanetary archaeology uh, yeah. where you are intentionally designing artifacts to be found potentially by other intelligences. I just, I love that as like a puzzle. Right? And I know that that's been attempted and that's been accomplished on at least one occasion with that golden record, yeah. which is sort of a very intentional piece of archaeology to be found ultimately mm -hmm. by, uh, by some intelligence maybe. But I love that puzzle of if you are designing a... What can you assume about whoever receives this thing or whatever receives this thing? And it's not obvious at all what you can assume. So how do you actually 
generate an artifact that communicates what you're trying to communicate. I'm struggling to remember the name now of the researcher who works on complexity as a uh, an analog for uh, biological life. I'll think of the name in a second. But um, one argument for, let's say, sending a, a probe, a spacecraft to Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, with these geysers, this sort of plumes of stuff that come out from the saltwater ocean that it has, um, is that you can fly through the plumes and detect particles and uh, do some kind of chemical or biological assay on the particles and decide whether or not that there's life uh, on the basis of what you find. You might find biological molecules. Um, that The way I frame it, I think, sounds straightforward enough, but if you're really into this, there's a lot of questions that uh, arise. One of them is that it it is possible, statistically possible, to create the biology of life through completely uh, abiological or, or non-biological means. Um, in fact, Carl Sagan and some other folks were involved in experiments years ago of uh, putting amino, uh, putting some basic uh, uh, building blocks of life in some kind of a vacuum chamber, hitting it with lightning, and just to see what would come up. And you you get a certain amount of amino, amino acids, things like tryptophan, for example. You think that comes from Turkey and Thanksgiving. Well, it actually turns out that it's not too difficult to make uh, abiologically. So the question is not necessarily do we see the molecules we associate with life, because actually those might not be hard to find if you are in an environment with a lot of energy and transport of chemistry and so forth. Really, it's more about the statistics of this. And uh, this, the argument goes something like, the more complicated a molecule is, the more effort, in a sense, it would take to build it, the more likely it is the result of um, intentional manipulation, or at least if not intentional, uh, directed manipulation, so directed toward the interests of a life form, let's say. So if we came across a DNA molecule, sure, there is some um, statistical possibility that one could be created. And if you found one of them, you couldn't necessarily separate that statistical possibility from the fact that that could have come from life. If you find two, that is so unlikely hmm. that it almost certainly is life. Even if what you get isn't a DNA molecule, but just some crazy combination of organic or even inorganic stuff, some bizarre mixture of silicon and carbon and who knows what, um, if it is so complex uh, that it is not going to come out of a natural process readily, you could assign a statistical probability that that is from life. Whether or not you recognize it as life, you don't know what this thing mm -hmm. might be. It might be the DNA of some protomolecule or something. You don't know what it is. But in fact, that's the argument uh, for uh, complexity as, as, as the evidence for, for life. So to your question mm -hmm. or your, uh, your observation, what would we leave to uh, provide the breadcrumbs or evidence of our existence? I think the answer is something complex. Does that mean that we should rearrange the asteroids into a QR code? You know, maybe. Um, should we create some kind of a Hallback array of magnets uh, that lives in Saturn's rings that uh, provide some kind of peculiar magnetic field that couldn't possibly have arisen through, um, you know, passive means? You know, maybe that's an implementation of this mm -hmm. idea. But I think complexity is the answer. And complexity could, could come in lots of different forms. It doesn't necessarily mean visually complex. It could be like in Arthur C. Clarke's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. You, you mentioned the obelisk from the Sentinel by uh, Asimov, right? So Arthur C. Clarke's uh, monolith is, uh, has specific dimensions. It's uh, 1 squared by 2 squared by 3 squared. It's 1 by 4 by 9 in dimensions. And the idea is that even though maybe, possibly, there could be some shard of meteorite that would come out looking a lot like a, a, a monolith, um, the odds are low, but super low, mm -hmm. that it's got this particular sequence of three squares like that. So the, the notion is that whatever intelligence created those uh, monoliths was doing so in a way that, they would, uh, that others would recognize them as intelligent, uh, uh, products of an intelligent mind. And what I'm saying is that that complexity, and there is complexity inherent in having super smooth surfaces and right angles, I mean, that is actually complex in a subtle way. You might think that an angle like 47.285 degrees is complex. I would say that 45 degrees is just as complex. Mm -hmm. And it also belies a certain uh, intelligence. 
anyway, that uh, that could be the kind of thing that we leave uh, as a golden record. It might not be something that has you know Nick Sagan's voice on it. it might not have a cool picture of you know uh, Da Vinci's uh, human, mm-hmm. um, but instead it could have evidence of complexity uh, that that communicates life. I've I've thought you know if this is true, if what we're looking for in the SETI context, right, that's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. If we're looking for something that is evidence of life, um, maybe that's what we should be looking for. So originally SETI was all about radio waves because at the time when we started that up, radio waves was the thing to do. And then we came up with laser communications. And guess what? Now there's optical SETI looking for laser communications. We are looking for ourselves in SETI, which is not wrong. Because after all, we might find ourselves somewhere else, and that would be interesting. But it also might be limiting. Instead, what we maybe want to look for is something unnatural or non-natural, whatever the word is. Mm -hmm. You don't want to say human-made or man-made. That's Mm -hmm. not the construct, right? It's it's not natural. Because it could be made by some process that uh, passes for intelligence or Mm -hmm. passes for intent. Um, But it would be through complexity, apparently. So, arguably, uh, that's what we should leave. And if we're looking for things, we should look for something complex. Uh, an interesting, maybe, mission or uh, technology to develop would be the complexity detector. Let's say that you could put a rover on the surface of the moon and take pictures of every little grain of whatever that you come across and run it through your complexity detector. Uh, there will be grains that look perfectly natural and some that look unnatural. And you could sort those. You give them a a complexity score. And maybe even ascribe uh, some intention to little grains you come across. Those grains might be the debris from some uh, distant past in which uh, an interstellar probe happened to pass by and maybe smacked into the moon or smacked onto the Earth before it became the moon. And Mm -hmm. In any case, if we could find those little bits of stuff, uh, maybe we have evidence of uh, interstellar uh, intelligence. but we could be looking for that, and we could be looking for it just on, around the corner. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, a, there's an old joke about the the guy who loses his wallet, and uh, he's looking for it uh, under a under a street lamp. And some uh, another person comes up and says, "What are you looking for?" He says, "Well, I lost my wallet." And the guy says, "Well, where'd you lose it? I lost it about a block away. Why are you looking here? The light's better here." <laughs> In this case, we'd actually take advantage of that fact. The light is better on the moon. Uh, I mean, in principle, it's better on the Earth, but we've kind of introduced into the earth tons of other stuff that is uh, you know, evidence of technological activity. So you want to go somewhere where the, there's not that and look for it. But what we're looking for, like I said, I think is probably complexity. Hmm. Or, again, unnaturalness, which I argue is the same. Uh, like a grain of regolith in the surface material on the surface of the, of the earth, uh, uh, the moon or, or an asteroid, uh, it's got certain characteristics a certain kind of cause and effect relationship that is responsible for its appearance, which is very simple. You know, the kind of natural processes that we can understand. What we would be looking for is something unnatural. If you found a perfect cube of titanium, mm-hmm. there's your answer right there. Again, not because it looks complex, but because it implies complexity by virtue of its very simplicity, just like Arthur C. Clarke's monolith. Mm-hmm. So you go ahead and uh, propose that to NSF and see if yeah. they find it. So, it, so if if technology were not an inhibitor, like you could suppose that you could access any location in, if we limit ourselves to so just like the solar system, where is where is the first place that you would go to try to find life? Is there a particular place that you feel like has greater likelihood than other places? Well, I'm going to have to rely on what I hear from my scientist friends okay. or acquaintances. Hardly any of them are friends. <laughs> uh, the... Uh, you know, we've been looking. Uh, we've been looking under the street lamp uh, for a long time. We've been looking where it's easy to go. We go to the moon. There's no life there. We go to Mars. Honestly, it's probably a big dead rock. Um, the quote that I like, and I, and I don't remember honestly who said this to me, but um, it's been observed that life is everywhere on Earth. Right? It's it's in the upper atmosphere. It's in these thermal vents under the ocean. There is not a niche on the entire planet that doesn't have life on it somewhere, even though there's some very inhospitable environments. I mean, the upper atmosphere, nothing really thrives there, but life can survive there, and there's certainly evidence of life there. So, same thing should be true of anywhere where life exists, that it should, you you can argue that there could be a time in the past where some cataclysm drove it underground, 
But over the course of the millions of years that followed, it would have come up with a way to sort of ooze through the surface and, and make a home on even the very, the very barren and inhospitable surface of, of Mars. It's, this is the argument that I've mm -hmm. heard. And therefore, if there's life anywhere, there's life everywhere. And conversely, if you go looking for life and you don't find it, it's because it's not anywhere. And therefore, there's not life. Mm -hmm. So we have looked and looked on Mars for life. And we haven't found it. And I conclude that there's no life on Mars. And I'm going to make the same conclusion for other places we've looked. We've looked and we haven't found it, and therefore it's not there. And it sounds a little like an mm -hmm. obvious statement, but there's a subtlety around the nature of life, finding a way. We haven't looked on Venus. Now, Venus is, uh, on the surface, it's apparently inhospitable. You know, 800 degrees, uh, super caustic uh, uh, or... Uh, you know, uh, corrosive chemicals on the surface. You don't want to be there. Maybe life could survive there. I don't know. But if life is there, or if life is anywhere on Venus, it'll be everywhere on Venus. There's a, a thin layer in Venus's atmosphere which actually replicates Earth's atmospheric conditions, the same fraction of oxygen, nitrogen, everything else. It's all in this one little, little band. Um, you could go there and check. If there's life there, um, you kind of have an answer. And there's some probability that it could be there because of all the violent chemical and thermal mixing in the atmosphere of Venus that could potentially be mm -hmm. some life there. It's, it's got that transport that you need to make life happen, as opposed to a big dead rock where nothing ever moves and you can't mix chemicals together to form life. And there's no lightning, for example, but there's plenty on Venus. So maybe you look there and you find it. And if you find it there, you're probably going to find it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So conversely... If you think there could be life in that little band, maybe you don't have to go to the little band. You send a probe that just kind of skims through the upper atmosphere of Venus and collects some samples, and maybe there you find your chemically complex molecules that indicate the presence of life. Mm -hmm. Would you ask me where I would look? The scientists say we should look where there is the water, follow the water. There are plenty of places in our solar system with wet, liquid oceans, and Mars ain't one of them, neither is Mercury, uh, but... Uh, Enceladus is one, Europa is one, Titan, uh, uh, below all the crud, there's one. Uh, these ocean worlds are places where life has a high probability of existing. People will argue the radiation environment is bad. Well, we have evidence uh, on Earth, in fact, of life that withstands radiation. Uh, there's a bacterium called Dinococcus radiodurans that actually thrives in radioactive ore, and it has a, a means of repairing its own DNA. Uh, which is the, the issue that, that arises uh, for radiation. And that's just on Earth, where, frankly, it's not really necessary. But, you know, no one was living there, so mm -hmm. I guess we'll go ahead and move in and learn how to repair our DNA. <laughs> that's what life does. And I would argue that it's probably going to do the same thing on, uh, let's say, a moon of Saturn or Jupiter, which is it'll have to withstand a nasty environment, but fortunately, under the saltwater oceans, and there may be actually be more water on Europa than there is on uh, Earth, or at least a d deeper ocean, um, it might be the case that they can have started, or the life forms can have started there. But they will eventually have evolved to fill every possible niche. So if we could send a probe to the surface of Europa, we would be able to find ice with little bits of stuff in it, which is, you know, uh, snail poop from the subsurface of, uh, yeah. of Europa. And I suppose if it's anything like Earth, the <laughs> speed with which life expands from its place of origin to subsume the entire place is really fast. Life infects. Okay, so the likelihood that you go and you look in the wrong space because it just hasn't gotten there yet, I yeah. suppose it's possible, but it's so improbable yeah. if it's anything like Earth. That's exactly the argument, yeah. And again, it's the counter-argument that, are, in my mind at least, convinces me that we don't need to be looking at Mars for life anymore. And there's, there's lessons to be learned. There's plenty of fascinating geological questions mm -hmm. to be answered and potentially even evidence of past life, potentially, right? But if you had to put your money on it, yeah, you should put your money on the, the ocean worlds. So yeah. an Enceladus flyby would be great, and a, a, a probe to uh, send something into the ocean of Europa would be great. Uh, maybe we'll find something in Titan with Dragonfly. Hmm. Uh, it's conceivable. You know, you know Dragonfly, right? Yeah. This is an a octocopter that's going to fly around uh, Titan's soupy atmosphere. It's so awesome. <laughs> it's very awesome. <laughs> so, you know, we were talking a little while ago about uh, sort of the aesthetic appeal of, yeah. uh, of engineered systems. There's going to be nothing about that as an engineered system that's going to be all that interesting uh, because, after all, we have these quadcopters, octocopters, whatever, on Earth. We've seen them before, so the look of it isn't going to be what does it. But it's the process of flying through the hydrocarbon atmosphere of a distant moon that's going to just kind of be cool on its own. So yeah. 
maybe that's a chill-inducing moment for some some kid who survived the pandemic and uh, can now uh, learn. So su- suppose that we went to one of these places, did not discover life. Is it okay to get it going there? <laughs> well, so this is where, you know, you'll get divergent opinions, right? Yeah. So none of these opinions are wrong. Let me be clear. But there is a science perspective on this, which is to say we should leave things in a pristine state so that we can learn from them in the future. And that's not wrong. We would like to learn these things in the future. There may be something we can learn from a pristine Mm -hmm. environment. Uh, There's also that kind of thread in in all of us, which is the, the dominate nature thread, where we see something we don't like and we make it in our own image. So we plant some crops uh, on what was originally a virgin forest. We, uh, you know, send microbes to Mars to terraform it. Or we either accidentally or on purpose uh, inoculate or this is a infect Europa with some kind of genetically engineered uh, critter uh, that does something for us, whatever that thing might be. Maybe it just demonstrates what's possible. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, of course, in the process, you could be uh, conducting genocide, uh, which I think would be not you know, good. Uh, so I think opinions vary on, on the value of putting life somewhere else. Um, I guess my own take is you want to do this thoughtfully. And I think if you satisfy either your own or your community's combination of ethical and moral standards, I don't see why in principle uh, it's forbidden for us to mm-hmm. go ahead and create life where it isn't. And, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure how I feel about it either, but on the one hand, I suppose it's conceivable that the origins of life on Earth could have been introduced like that. And if that was the case, boy, am I grateful to whoever came and got <laughs> things going here. That's a great, you know what I mean? great point. So, you know, the, the theory has a name, right? It's an unfortunate name. I was at a conference where uh, there was a sign-up sheet listing... Uh, alternative to the word panspermia. Okay. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, you know, the, the 15-year-old in all of us is going to giggle at that, right? And not saying you're 15, but it's just, yeah, that's, it induces that response. But it just means uh, sending seed out everywhere or that the seed from everywhere is 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 what causes life or is, is the source of that. Yeah. So that, um, that notion is not entirely far-fetched, in my opinion especially since we've seen things like um, meteorites from the surface of Mars land on Earth. Mm -hmm. Um, Inside those things, potentially, there could be, could have been life. I'm not saying life started on Mars and came here, but there's at least evidence for the transport of material across planetary surfaces in a way that doesn't completely destroy them or, you know, sterilize them or something like that. Uh, But yeah, there's every reason to uh, suspect that life might not be unique to our planet. And if it came came to be the way that it is on our planet with, you know, roughly carbon-based, with DNA as the basis of it and so forth, um, and able to use certain uh, forms of chemistry for extracting energy from the environment. It, it worked well once. It could work well again in some other place. And does that mean that someone put it there? And whether it's a someone or it's just a natural process, like at some point the Earth might well get obliterated by some uh, unfriendly asteroid. Mm-hmm. And as huge chunks, and I'm talking about thousand kilometer scale chunks of this stuff go careening around the solar system, one of them ends up on Europa and uh, infects Mm -hmm. Europa with whatever we've got going on here. I think it's not unreasonable to assume that it would be possible for the life that resides in that huge chunk of Earth to take root on Europa or Mm -hmm. Enceladus or Titan or you name it. So you can imagine scenarios that aren't that far-fetched where the transport of biological material across the solar system or even beyond uh, could be responsible for it, uh, for, for life existing wherever it is. You know, as I, I was saying before, life will find a way, right? That's a, a quote from uh, Jurassic Park. Um, and that's that's the nature of life, right? I mean, just by its very definition, life is a thing that makes itself, Yeah. right? That's And so you're going to be up against that. If you want life not to be somewhere, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, you're asking, is it okay for us to put life somewhere? I think we have no choice. If we want to, if we take seriously our role as explorers, as inhabitants of our solar system, if we believe that we have every right to be anywhere in the solar system, maybe beyond, we're going to end up dragging along with us life. It's going to come in the form of little yeast molecules clinging to our shoes. It's going to come in the form of maybe some 
uh, water bears that are uh, mm -hmm. stuck on uh, our favorite rock sample. Um, anyway, th th all those things will will distribute life pretty much necessarily. So it's either you're going to have you're going to make it happen or mm -hmm. you can't go. Is my opinion. Even even today, we take a lot of effort to ensure that probes to other planets are as sterile as we can possibly make them. And arguably, the path through interplanetary space sterilizes certainly the surface, which is where most of the stuff is going to come from. Because after all, when they were launched, they're pretty well infected with Earth stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in, on the interior, it's more or less cleaned up, and it's good. But I think we're going to transmit stuff to the surfaces. So if it's possible, again, on these more uh, life-friendly ocean worlds, to nurture life, I think anything we land there is going to be responsible for putting life there. Hmm. That's my opinion. I, you know, I just don't see any way around it. Planetary protection is the name of the process whereby we ensure that we don't uh, infect other planets. Yeah. So you were saying that the rule, the the law that describes what we are and aren't allowed to introduce to other planets mm. is the Planetary Protection Act, which is vaguely similar to the Prime Directive from Star Trek. Yeah, and planetary protection, uh, the notion is that you. Uh, they call it both forward and backward, I guess, uh, contam contamination. Uh, notionally, we don't want to contaminate another uh, planetary surface for perhaps ethical reasons and at least scientific reasons. And then we don't want back contamination. We don't want to bring back the zombie virus or whatever, and, and then we all suffer for that. Um, fair enough, right? And one should be cautious and thoughtful about these things. But the prime directive for Star Trek is a bit more about culture, right? I th apparently... Spock and McCoy and everyone else are, are perfectly fine tromping around on the surface of a planet, even a, a completely uh, unspoiled landscape, as long as they don't encounter anybody and cause confusion. And in fact, they can wear costumes, and that's still okay, <laughs> you know? I think it's, from a purely narrative perspective, it's convenient that that's the prime directive, but the prime directive uh, for us at the moment doesn't involve any intelligent life, right? It's only whatever uh, we think might we might encounter in the form of uh, just life in general, and really it's about not infecting it, mm -hmm. which is a fair point. I mean, you know, we, we can, on Earth here, we, we experience pandemics and other things with viruses that have uh, evolved on Earth, and and you would think uh, we would have some, uh, you know, immunity to them, and we don't. You know, if Ebola were ever to escape into the population at large, that would be kind of disastrous. There's plenty of other things, Marburg among them, that would just... Uh, because they're going to bleed out in a matter of hours. Uh, not to get particularly dark about it, but those are things that we know about. Now, there's an argument, and I'm sure you're aware of this, that um, the reason that viruses uh, are virulent on the Earth is that they co-evolved with us and with our life. Some other life form, let's say some other virus that we encounter on Enceladus, is going to be so different from anything that we're familiar with, it will have no impact. There's no way for it to... Uh, well. Arguably, if our life is so different from whatever it is on, on Enceladus, uh, there's no way that a virus from Enceladus would have been able to evolve to exploit the various weaknesses in our cell structure and so forth that make it possible to replicate using our bodies. So we would just we would just be able to brush them off like dust, and it would not be a problem. Hmm. So it's one of those things that you're talking about H.G. Wells, right? War of the Worlds is an interesting model there, where the these virtually indomitable aliens were destroyed by the common cold, right? Just a virus that they hadn't encountered. That seems less likely uh, if the biology of our, you know, respective species were uh, so very different. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, you know, a lot of viruses, some viruses can cross species on Earth, but most of them don't, right? There are some things that uh, make some animals sick that just don't affect us at all, vice versa. So, you know, species, uh, species uh, distinctions are sufficient to, uh, to immunize effectively. Mm -hmm us against certain uh, viruses. And so you would think that, and, and again, that's just, we all come from more or less a common biological ancestor. So think instead of something that arose from uh, Europa or Enceladus without any common ancestor, unless we posit pan panspermia, yep, um, they would have very little chance of, uh, the, those viruses have very little chance of being virulent for both them and for us. Hmm. That's the argument anyway. Okay. Not being a planetary epidemiologist myself, yeah, sure. I can't <laughs> speak with any authority, but I'm interested in the idea here sure. in response to your question. So these, you mentioned H.G. Wells, and we've talked about a few of these other, like, stories. There have been thousands and thousands and thousands of stories, right? Most of them have died out. 
But there are these handful of stories that seem to stick and remain in our culture. Mm. Is there anything special you think about those stories? It doesn't, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it, it doesn't feel like it's random. It feels like there's something special about certain sets of stories in particular that give them this sticking cultural value, science fiction or otherwise. Do you feel like there's any pattern there? Well, so are you, are you getting at um, this notion that there are, let's say, uh, stories involving a hero who accomplishes something, right? So saves the world or saves uh, him or herself, uh, or uh, something like uh, something more specific. I don't, I'm not. I suppose I'm not really driving at anything in particular. I, I guess the hero's journey is something that pops up all over yeah. the place and kind yeah. of always has. But then you get these other examples of, I don't know, like um, pieces of literature or. Uh, Science fiction, or I'm, I'm, like Dune, for instance, mm. right? Why why is Dune still with us? Why is Dante oh, still with us? I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, uh, great question. Whether well, is it? A, it's probably a combination of aesthetics and the the novelty of the thing, the experience. Yeah. Um, I don't know that it's because of great lessons learned. You know, in other words, I don't know that we we're grateful for having learned that lesson, and that's why we keep it around. I, I have to think it's mostly for its um, its value as entertainment um, and, and what what makes something entertaining. I mean, again, I think it's the novelty and I think it's the some aspect of aesthetics. Yeah. You know, in the case of Dune, um, you know, you've got a 15-year-old protagonist, which certainly appeals to the 15-year-old audience for science fiction. Um, maybe not the women who would read it, but the 15-year-old boys, certainly. Um, and this, there's definitely... Uh, those trends exist today, right? There's there's a huge renaissance in uh, black or Afro uh, science fiction, which is, is pretty awesome. It centers around uh, characters and situations. They're specific uh, to um, African Americans or people of African descent or black people that are uh, that opens up a whole new world of possibilities, and that I think some readers would find more accessible and relatable and relevant in a way that you know a lot of science fiction appeals to you know white males. Um, because it's sort of written for that audience, or at least by that audience. Mm. So it's kind of complicated. It's hard, so it's hard to know whether things stick around because of uh, some cultural hegemony, um, or because they're just legitimately, independently great for some reason. Yeah, I, the the notion of. Uh... I agree with you that I don't think it's because like, oh, we're so glad we got the lessons from Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, that. in my own experience, I feel like as soon as I perceive that some author's trying to like give me a lesson, it's a bit of a turnoff. <laughs> yeah. It's like, who is this adult telling another adult? How? But the the one of the things that attracts me to some of these stories that have been around for a long time is some of them feel to me almost like the author is trying to figure something out. And the mechanism by which they're trying to figure this thing out is a story. That's interesting. And so it's, I, f I feel sometimes like this is why sometimes literature gets a reputation for being, quote, boring. Hmm. Because some of it, and particularly I would say, like, I, I've been attracted recently to, like, Russian stuff. It just feels like the authors are working on an idea. And, and for their particular minds, the way that they flesh out an idea is by constructing a narrative where... Things happen, but there's not necessarily like a hero's journey of a particular variety. There's maybe some character development, but it's it's largely the flushing out of an idea. I don't know. It feels to me like some of the old literature stuff has that property to it. But now I'm sure you could. I'm sure there are exceptions to that rule. But well, it, it's interesting to think of literature as catharsis for the author, or maybe meditation by the author. You know, it's an opportunity for the author to work out a, an issue of their own or to entertain themselves in the process of writing the book. Yeah. And I think it's only possible with something like art, which is generally not developed by a committee. You know, we were talking about engineered systems a little while ago, and in an engineered system, necessarily, there are many people involved in building this. It's very rare to find the, uh, to go back to this example, the Doc Brown inventor who invents uh, a, a time travel machine completely on his or her own, right? It's just, it takes so much expertise in so many different areas that I just, I can't, see it for a, a contemporary engineer system of any interest. You know, it, it's occurred to me from time to time, could I actually build my own CubeSat? What would it take? Could, do I have what it takes to do that? And the quick answer is no, but I'd be studying up and I'd learn a whole bunch of different things. And in the process, 
I'd probably make adequate, decent design choices about certain things, but they would probably stink compared to if I had someone like you help with the, the flight computer, right? That would that would completely change the quality of it. And, and so necessarily, these are multi-person things, these engineered systems, but a piece of art, I don't know that art by committee is ever good. Um, and literature in particular, I think, is very problematic. You, you I think an, a writer holds in his or her head this, the notion of the novel or the vision for the characters, and every word they put on the page is, you know, kind of a version of or a reflection of or a consequence of that, that kind of ultimate really, really real thing that they hold in their head, that kind of platonic ideal of the thing they want to have come out. And as they keep whacking at it and trying to improve it, it's trying to get it closer and closer to the image that they have in their head. That process, it doesn't seem, would translate to a committee mm -hmm. kind of function. Um, so I think that maybe one of the things that's appealing about art is um, it represents a singular vision, or maybe idiosyncratic vision. You know, this, this vision that you haven't seen anywhere else. And that's what makes it uh, exciting and interesting and novel. Where I think that you could uh, uh, potentially have that kind of sense of a uh, an engineered system, you know, like who was the first person to think of the X Y Z, but that's about as far as it goes mm -hmm. because to actually build the X Y Z required the rest of the alphabet of people to <laughs> actually contribute. Yeah, it's now that I'm I'm thinking back about we were talking about human made things that induce chills. Almost all of them are the product of a single mind or yeah. the vision of a single mind that was then manifested with the help of a team. Mm. But as I think about it now, it's this, it's almost, maybe I could come up with an exception, but right now I can't. I don't think any of them are by committee. I, I think it's, with, there's probably exceptions, but I think for the most part, my sense is uh, just popular movies, the ones that really work well, I mean, the, the top, yeah. top of their game movies are where you have a particularly strong, even kind of a fascist director who has a vision, an uncompromising vision for what that thing is. I'll, I'll take um, Guillermo del Toro's movies, for example, Pan's Labyrinth, Devil's Backbone, the, the new Pinocchio movie. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen that thing. Um, these are all examples where I think if you had uh, a lot of heavy-handed studio executives continually fiddling with it, it would sort of grind down the, the peaks and flatten out the experience so it just becomes a kind of run-of-the-mill throwaway movie that no one's really interested in. You know, a lot of the really f the failures of, of in popular culture, I think, that movies and books and things aren't failures of execution, although there are certainly some, but they're failures of vision, absence of vision. It's, you know, we don't have a good idea, so we're going to make a sequel. You know, the, the vision has left the building at that point. You know, there's just no more vision. It's just a, it's a dull thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that one of, one of the exciting aspects, uh, really, of any creative act is seeing that vision realize. So for me, as a person who wants to create a thing, and I'm, I'm interested in seeing that thing come into the world, the more idiosyncratic, in some respects, the better. I mean, that's kind of what I'm looking for in, in my own work. Not that it's sort of out there and no one wants to uh, mm -hmm. know about it, but rather that it really does represent the thing that I'm interested in doing. And that can stand in the way sometimes. I mean, there's often, in the case of, of a collaboration, of course, you got to set aside your the fact that you're kind of married to a particular way that this is going to work, and let the rest of the team come up with the best possible answer. You know, it's there's going to be one person on the team who really gets it more than the rest, and that's the person who needs to then solve that problem that way. Mm -hmm. That's very difficult to recognize it because, again, I think the act of creation is very much a selfish one and even a cathartic one. If I go to, to, to develop my new anti-gravity device and I don't see it done the way I want it to, I'm going to feel a little bit disappointed that I've missed uh, what it might have taken uh, to really see my vision come to reality. And I recognize that as an egotistical kind of thing to do. So I guess what I'm getting at is that in the, notionally for for art, for novels, uh, for even uh, you know, even science fiction, anything you like, um, you're going to depend on that author's vision. That's that's what you're going to take. So if you don't like Stanislaw Lem, you're not going to like any of his books. I'll never have anything to <laughs> offer you. I actually do enjoy it. You're talking about Russian literature. He's Polish, so not too far off. But it's definitely the case that you get um, idiosyncratic literature. I mean, for virtually any book that really stands out is going to have that uniqueness to it, right? Yeah. In one of your previous lives when you were studying English, which yeah. which stories did you study? Uh, I, I got to the point of sort of midway in my PhD, okay? So 
undergrad degree in English, master's in English, and then like a year into the PhD. So kind of two years worth of graduate work. Uh, and at that point, I was still taking the more or less required stuff that a person has to has to do. So a you know, fairly broad range of things. Um, but I was interested in <coughs> I was interested in medieval literature because of its kind of surprising foreignness, and also in modern literature because of its you know, again novelty. And those two don't talk to each other particularly <laughs> okay. effectively, uh, and, and in a literal sense too. I mean, the, the faculty who did that were on opposite sides of the, the hallway in the um, in the University of Chicago where I was. Anyway, the, so I was interested in medieval literature. I think that there's one of the things I found interesting about that about it is, in some really fundamental way, it is that is the literature that's at the core of our experience as English speakers, um, and a lot of contemporary things we can't take for granted kind of trace back to that, and and this notion of it's almost like archaeology, a sort of tracing back words, sounds, places, ideas, kind of way back. Uh, is is a really interesting and exciting one. It feels like you're you're probing fairly deeply into the human experience by probing deeply into the history of it as well. Uh, you're, you're kind of peeling back generations and layers of, of personal and political behaviors and whatever until you get to something else. So I did study uh, a lot of Middle English literature. I also studied the language Old English, which is not the language of Middle English literature. Middle English is that la language. Mm -hmm. um, it's all completely fascinating. I still remember some you know, unnecessary things in Middle English and Old English. Uh, so in terms of modern literature, the, the, the problem with that, of course, there's probably a thousand times as much modern literature, whatever modern means, as medieval literature. So, you know, it's, it's hard to even call it a body of work. Yeah, I suppose people that study old literature, I suppose, have the benefit of a time filter. Maybe time, time, time fields are also just fine. There was no one's writing new medieval literature. Right? Yeah, sure. You yeah. can say George R. R. Martin is giving it a shot, but it's not at all that. I mean, medieval literature has a really peculiar and and just just an odd quality. It's it's definitely a certain kind of thing. There's tons of assumptions that go behind it, and like probably reading any literature, you kind of have to bring to your reading of the literature some awareness of the historical context and a few of the other things around it. Sure. For modern literature, that's sort of a passive act because I I live in the modern era, <laughs> yeah. and literature written for me is going to be literature I find accessible. Two hundred years from now, are people going to uh, look back uh, at uh, uh, Jonathan Safran Foer's book about uh, nine eleven, and understand what the hell nine eleven even was? I mean, very possibly not. Right. And that book just won't make sense. It's one of the things I really disliked about eighteenth uh, century literature. Honestly, the, it's my least favorite. Um, there are authors like Dryden and Pope who basically are constantly referencing uh, modern day for them politics about which I could not care less. <laughs> I have zero, zero interest in any of that stuff. And so it's kind of like people making cute, snarky references today. You can make some cute, snarky reference about your favorite political figure and people will get it for the next 10 or 20, 20 years maybe. Yeah. After that point, that's completely lost to the mists of time. Nobody will get those references anymore. All the all the memes that set us apart from the people in their 20s, um, those, are, uh, those will no longer be current. Yeah. And things that I think are memes, like referencing Back to the Future. Uh, I used to do this in class, by the way. I used to talk about the flux capacitor as an example of technology development. No one has seen that movie anymore. <laughs> no kids have ever seen that show. No idea what I'm talking about. I'm just a crazy old man. Which is probably just as well. Have you, so there's that famous interview with Oppenheimer right after the bomb went off where he's asked how he felt and he sort of impulsively quotes the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's eerie. It's and, a hell of a quote. It's, <laughs> I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Um, but, and, and I, don't, I don't know when that thought occurred to him, but in watching that happen, it, it looked like this line from literature just came sort of screaming into his consciousness. Have you ever had that experience in your own life where a, a line or a character or a circumstance from one of these stories that you've read sort of just came erupting into your consciousness? I think so. Actually, it happened yesterday. I don't know why. I'm trying to remember who I was talking to, but for some reason I ended up with like four or five quotes in the process of talking <laughs> to this person. Um, and I think one reason is that you know the author has spent a lot of time carefully crafting that quote, not just to make it uh, trip off the tongue uh, conveniently, but but actually, you know, making it really pithy. Like it just it just captures 
something and and that uh, that depth of understanding that a very you know concise comment can bring I think is really helpful. Some people quote for the sake of just seeming erudite. I don't think that's helpful, <laughs> but I do like to use things I've read because they've said it better than I could. Uh, one of my favorites in this context is from Theodore von Karman. He's one of the founders of the Jet Propulsion Lab. He said that scientists discover the world that is, engineers create the world that never was, or something to that effect. Um, and in the in that quote, there's a lot to unpack there, but that's why it's so successful, because it's really concise. He's not saying that one's better than the other, but what he's saying is there's two different impulses in humanity, but they're clearly different. And the reason we have different words for things is because they're different. You know, an engineer is different from a scientist, or a technologist is different from a scientist. And that difference helps us understand things a bit, because if you were to listen to the local news and they say something like, uh, NASA scientists have built a new rocket, uh, they're wrong on at least two counts. I mean, first of all, NASA doesn't do really any of that stuff, right? They cause it to be done through contracts. But also, because scientists never built a rocket, ever. Um, it wasn't science. It was a technology problem when they were building something. In fact, maybe even a technical problem, not even a, a scientific or engineering problem. Point is, um, those are different impulses. And if I were to explain that like I'm trying to do now, mm -hmm. it's going to take me five minutes to really get the point across successfully. But if you can just take uh, von Karman's roughly 10 words uh, to convey that, I think it's more effective. So I think that, for me at least, uh, I think it's great to have little ideas at the ready like that that you can deploy and try to make your points. So I think that's why it happens. But in terms of rushing into your mind like you're overwhelmed and you absolutely must say it, I guess maybe that's an example where sure. those things, it comes up. I'm often triggered by things like this. Some people say, oh, so you're a rocket scientist. I'm, no, I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm absolutely not. In fact, I don't know anyone who's a rocket scientist. <laughs> I know people who are rocket engineers for sure. I know space scientists. At that point, I've lost them and they've walked away. And, <laughs> and they have every right to do so. Um, maybe, we, maybe I could just wrap up with two totally non sequitur questions. Um, do you hold anything to be true that is unprovable? <laughs> okay, that's interesting. I'm going to argue that most opinions are pretty well unprovable. So I have a notion that there's good and bad, and uh, that good and bad kind of governs, or I hope that it governs how I behave. Good and bad has to do with interpersonal reactions, uh, interactions, and it has to do with maybe more societal stuff. Things I do that I think are good, I do because of that uh, limitation, and I'm aware that there are alternatives. So, for example, I could, uh, someone drops something, I could walk right by them. But I usually don't. I usually stop, and I pick that thing up, and I help them out. Uh, that's, I take that to be good. And now, can I prove that the consequences of that is actually uh, to anyone's benefit? For example, maybe it's not to anyone's benefit that I help that guy pick up his, his mail that he dropped by the street. This example that happened last month. You know, I can't prove that that's the case. But no, I hold, I hold that there's a, sort of a more general truth about the value of good. And I don't think it's as simple as that good is what we make it. I think that there are some things that we can objectively describe as good. And again, that's an unprovable assertion. Um, but it has to do something with um, what uh, leads to um, you know, safety, security, happiness, health of people around us uh, and maybe the, the world mm. at large. So I take that to be an example. Um, but I mean, if you're asking about other things like uh, supreme beings and things like this, I guess my, my general take is that I am confident I don't know enough. So I, I take as true the fact that that's more or less unknowable, at least by me. I don't have the evidence. And if you, even if not evidence, um, I don't have the, um, the kind of logical structure that I could put around that idea and feel comfortable with it. Hmm. But is that kind of what you're getting at? It's exactly what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that's a, it's a subtle question, right? Because I think certainly in these days, one's own beliefs and what you think are true uh, and also real, uh, those are under kind of political attack, which seems like it's it's the last dis ditch effort by people with bad intentions to affect our society in a way that gives them power and takes power away from other people. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm pretty suspicious of uh, of connecting. Uh, questions of, of faith and questions of politics. Mm -hmm. But again, that's an assumption that I have. I'm going to sure. I'm going to assume that that's an unhealthy thing. Sure. There's plenty of examples from the past. 
the uh, Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, uh, where uh, having a religion deeply embedded within your society led to some degree of success for some time. Don't know if that's uh, the way I'd put it now, sure. but that sort of happened. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't last forever, but you know, ours yeah. isn't lasting forever either. Yeah. Um, and then I, I suppose just as a last question, in the history of life on this planet, there have been a handful of, you could call them important moments, moments that you might write down on the list of like, then this happened, then this happened. So mm. maybe single cellular organisms becoming multicellular, maybe fish calling out of the ocean. Um, what do you think was the most recent of these events? And what do you think will be the next one? Oh. I'm temp right off the, the bat, I'm tempted to say we turned a corner as, as humans sometime in the 19th century where we started affecting the planet in a permanent and detectable way. Uh, before then, all of our emissions, whether they're biological or, or kind of parabiological, in other words, creating fires and building houses and cutting down forests and whatnot, they were really a drop in the bucket. And the Earth would have, uh, you know, if we had suddenly stopped existing, the Earth would have just sort of passed over that as a blip and wouldn't have really had any impact. But we've, we've had enough impact. Now, I'm not talking exclusively about climate change, but I just mean in general, reshaping the Earth's surface, uh, affecting the, the distribution of species in the ocean and on Earth. Um, I, can't remember, I think this was Paul McCready gave a talk once before he passed away, pointed out that something like 95% of the mass of animals in the United States are either pets or food, which is an amazing thought. You know, you'd think you could add up all the all the squirrels and the birds and the worms and stuff, and you'd have a massive amount of of just flesh. But actually, it turns out, no. Um, which is, again, to me, uh, I don't know if it's an imbalance. I wouldn't say it that way, but it's an impact. So I think that impact started over 100 years ago. And now we're in a position where our activities, just, just not even trying particularly hard, just living our lives the way we live them, have such a profound impact on the planet and what it is that we could go back, but we're not going to, you know? So what does that mean for the Earth going forward? I don't think we're, it's not, in my opinion, realistic to expect that we're going to restore the Earth, to, if that's the word, to the you know, late 17th century. That just doesn't seem super likely. I'm not sure we'd want it that way either. Maybe we would. Some people would. Uh, but I think that that's definitely one of those turning points. It was the, you know, what do they call that? The... Um, uh, yeah, there's a there's a archaeology word for it. I'm forgetting, but it's the the name for the the layer that we're in right now. Mm. Um, so you know you had uh, whatever it is. Anyway, so there's the the, the techno layer of where, the technolith or something like that where we live in history uh, has that impact. If you look geologically at our time, uh, you see all sorts of impacts. You know, like the you talked about the Schistolub impact that you know, that wiped out uh, a large number of species and led to the rise of mammals as the, as the dominant uh, species on the earth. Um, that happened, you know, what, 60 million years ago or something? And you can see evidence of that in the strata, right? You can actually find this super thin layer of, uh, of material like iridium that apparently you know, is exclusively from satellite, uh, sorry, not satellites, asteroid impacts. You can find that thin layer uh, everywhere on, on planet pretty much. Uh, there's another layer just like that that we're producing, right? It's a layer of whatever microplastics, I don't know, stuff that's going to show up um, in the millennia to come, if you know sedimentation mm -hmm. continues, and I suppose it will. Although there's an argument that it doesn't. Uh, if you look at, uh, have you been to Rome or any of the sort of older cities? Long, in, long time ago. Maybe yeah. Paris, right? So there are um, there are cities in Europe which are which have been inhabited continuously for thousands of years, and there the street level when the Roman Empire was sort of at its height is something like five or ten meters lower than it is right now. And most of what has caused that is the continual buildup of, of horse crap and human crap and just stuff over time. A little bit from outer space, not much. Mm -hmm. You know, so slowly swelling the surface of of Rome. Uh, and it's true in Paris, it's true of other places. And so now you know, you'll you you'll dig down to, to make a new subway and you suddenly discover ships. And where, where did they come from? Oh, there used to be a, a bay here. We just kind of slowly filled it up. Um, so there are these strata 
that used to be formed when we were in a different relationship to the space around us, where we would just leave our poo everywhere. Mm -hmm. We're not in that mode anymore, are we? We flush our poo elsewhere. And so actually the surface height of cities has stayed almost the same for about 100 years or maybe more. And that's a weird pause in the continual stratification of the Earth's surface, and therefore in the f ability of future archaeologists to figure out what happened when. So it's not just that we see a little layer of microplastics and carbon and whatever else we've, we've produced. It's also maybe the last layer. <laughs> you know, sure. and there, may, there may come others as certain cities are abandoned. They'll, they'll cover up with leaves and whatever and continue to get... That would be sort of an interesting thought that one of the things we've done is stop the earth from growing. Or at least stop it growing the way that it used to grow. And now we're growing other places. Uh, we're digging stuff out of the earth and then pushing it off into the ocean effectively is what we're doing. Right? Mm. We, we, we mine it, we consume it, and we poop it out into the ocean. It's pretty much so we're kind of flattening the earth in different ways. Anyway, that's that's a change. Um, I, I I don't think we're yet at the point where the other change that I have in mind is dominating our experience, and that's the space age. Let's call it. Um, so it's true that we've, as Carl Sagan said, just begun dipping our toes into the uh, edge of the cosmic ocean. Right? We're just just starting that process. Um, but the number of people who have flown to space is so small that it basically represents nobody at this point, statistically. The amount of mass we've put into space um, is basically nothing. You know, it's a few um, aircraft carriers worth of mass, if that and probably just one aircraft carriage worth of mass. I should look that up, but it's probably less than an aircraft mm -hmm. carriage worth of mass. So again, a nit, a, a blip. People are concerned about orbital debris, and they should be, but also the total amount of mass, ultimately not that much. So we're, we haven't made that change yet, but I think we're, we're about to get there. I'm going to say in the next 20, 30 years, we'll be at a point where we will treat the mass of the solar system the way we treat the surface of the Earth, which is to say we'll use it. And... You know, you can imagine all sorts of habitats, uh, spacecraft, uh, multi-generational spacecraft, uh, outposts on uh, up in the upper atmosphere of Venus, you know, anything you could imagine. All the mass we need to make that is already in space. It's just in the wrong shape, right? We're going to use some mixture of additive manufacturing and reuse of already manufactured stuff to establish that layer, that new stratum of human activity in space. Uh, I don't think archaeologists consider the planetary scale when they think about strata, right? And they think about the geological scale on a planetary surface where we're talking about hundreds to maybe thousands of meters worth of stuff. But really there's another scale, and that's that debris or whatever that uh, exists, that accretes on the surface of a solar system. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're about to start doing. So at the same time as we have stopped accreting mass on the surface of our major cities in, in the world, we're starting to accrete it um, on the moon, potentially on asteroids and elsewhere, on Mars. You know, the statistics of that accretion on Mars are super tiny, right? There's on the scale of a few thousand kilograms worth of mass on Mars that we put there. And the rest of it is basically not our responsibility. But there will come a time, maybe when Elon Musk opens his casino out there, that uh, the mass will start to increase to the point where actually we will have had a geological impact on not just the Earth, but also on the solar system. So I'm going to put those two those mm -hmm. two points uh, uh, on your on your list. The one point being, uh, somewhere around 100 years ago, we uh, started changing our planet's surface in a detectable way for the future, and another one uh, coming up in somewhere in the next century, we will start adding our own stratum to the solar system in an analogous way. Hmm. Or perhaps you disagree. No, I think so. <laughs> okay, good. Would, would it be safe to the the the, the previous uh, notable item on the list that you were describing? Would you associate that with the industrial revolution? Do you think? I think roughly that, yeah. Okay. And so, it's you know, power and water and food all go together in a complicated way uh, on the Earth, right? In order to really impact the Earth's surface, you need self-propelled vehicles, and Self-propelled vehicles kind of started with locomotives, you know, but really they were barely that. You know, they're just sort of a again a toe in the in the cosmic ocean of, mm -hmm. of vehicles because you know they're not really all that independent. They they ride on rails for the most part, except for the traction engines and so forth. But you know, basically they all ride on rails. Uh, 
and their efficiency, their mileage was very poor. Plus, they needed a working fluid, like say steam engines needed water all the time to keep working. So they were barely self-sufficient, barely autonomous in any useful way. In fact, he had an engineer and a, and a person stoking the coal to yeah. keep him working and maybe a whole team of people necessary. But it was a start. But sometime around the auto engine, or, uh, OTTO, in, in the late uh, 19th century, that changed. And what changed was now you can have things like um, industrial machinery to reshape the land. Uh, trains couldn't really do that. You know, but instead now with something like, uh, I guess we started with steam shovels, so steam-powered uh, machinery, and then diesel-powered, and now maybe even electric soon, or we're already there, uh, we can flatten mountains, and we can fill in lakes, and we have. Mm -hmm. And that that's the power I'm describing. So it took the Industrial Revolution, but not because of industry per se, not because necessarily of mass production. I think it was actually a confluence of a whole bunch of things that led to our ability to reshape the planet's surface. So uh, if there's a word like Holocene that, that describes this, I'm not sure what it is. Sure. It's something like the, the Technocene, where, where we're actually able to turn our power toward the Earth itself. And soon we'll turn that power toward the solar system. Uh, so we haven't gotten there yet. But that's the distinction I'm making. So I agree, it's, it correlates with the Industrial Revolution, but it's not exclusively every part of the Industrial Revolution. It's just the, uh, the industrial machinery that really makes this sure. possible. A lot of things that happened in, in the Industrial Revolution were more about um, automation and efficiency and other things, and of course, exploitation of people. But um, you know, the the earliest example, one of my favorites, the Jacquard loom, right? This is actually late 19th, uh, 18th century, right? This is the, the means by which you would create a pattern for, for huge tapestries, uh, J-A-C-Q-U-A-R-D. The Jacquard loom used uh, something like a paper template, like on a player piano, to, uh, to decide where the stitching went for, <laughs> for tapestries. and in itself was the precursor to the, you know, the early 20th century or mid-20th century uh, card-based input for computers. The wow. same basic idea. Uh, get, so you went from the Jacquard loom to IBM's innovation in the 1920s or whatever it was, the, the punch card, uh, which ultimately led to how uh, we do things uh, now. But that, that whole model was also kind of a data revolution or, or something like a data translation revolution. So accompanying the creation of these machines... Uh, was also sort of a data revolution and an efficiency revolution. How we build things in factories and how they did this started with weaving, right? And so those industrial looms and so forth were really the kind of the origins of some of the stuff that we then expanded to all sorts of other manufacturing, manufacturing teapots and glass and so forth in a factory setting. It was really more of a kind of um, information revolution than it was anything else. The The technologies involved were kind of already in place. It was just it took someone looking at it as a factory as opposed to as an artisanal practice hmm. that made it what it was. And of course, then lots of other things snowball from there. But what I'm saying is its origins really weren't about reshaping the earth. It was really more of, like I said, a, a kind of a process revolution than anything else. But the consequence of that is you developed the capabilities to support that process change, which then could go on and reshape the earth. So I think that that's a distinction that I would draw, maybe kind of a purely academic one, but, sure. but the consequence is that now, and since probably then, I think it's no accident that starting with the ability to reshape the earth, people like Jules Fern started thinking about how do we then re, uh, rework the earth? How do we live differently with respect to the earth? It used to be that the earth was all there was and it was just forests and deer and we would shoot them when we needed them. And then it became, we have dominion over this thing. And so when we have dominion over nature, what else do we have dominion over? Well, maybe we have dominion over the moon and space flight and all sorts of other time itself. Yeah. So I think that that sort of set in motion, this ability to change the world around us, the physical surface of the earth, it's set in motion uh, this trend, which we now kind of take for granted, which is we have the opportunity and maybe even the right, I don't know, to dominate the natural world. And in the case of the solar system, to reshape it to our needs, to turn it into... The habitat that we want it to be, the you know, O'Neill colony, if you know what I mean, the huge space colony that's some kind of massive ring world. Uh, we have the opportunity to do that. I think the the question is still open: Do we have the right to do that? I think we may, but it sort of depends on whose in whose way we are when we mm -hmm. do this. If we were to discover a whole uh, 
species of little smart fish under the surface of, uh, Euro uh, of Europa, right? Or Enceladus or something. How would we think about that? You know that there's some, be some people about thinking like, well, how can I best exploit that for you know, some purpose? Other people would be uh, aghast and up in arms and want you never to touch them ever again and, and, and invoke some kind of you know, prime directive to keep mm -hmm. us away from Enceladus. So I think the responses to that are going to be as varied as the responses there have always been to every kind of uh, economic or ecological or environmental, I don't want to call it innovation, but change that has happened on the earth. It's going to be that kind of stuff all over again. Hmm. We just haven't seen it yet. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mason. It's been <laughs> yeah, such a welcome. privilege. <laughs> really, really fun. Thank you. It's been great, Hunter. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Cool.